ahead and start the stream. Okay, Ellen, we are recording and live stream. Thank you. Welcome back everyone to day two. I'm gonna turn things right over to uh, our vice chair, Victor McCrary and the Vision Implementation Working Group. They've prepared a retrospective of the first year of vision implementation and will share priorities for year two. Vic. Thank you, thank you, Ellen. And uh, good morning to everybody. I'm Victor McCrary, vice chair of the National Science Board and chair of the Vision 2030 Implementation Group or VIWG as some call it, or as sometimes it's pronounced VIG. And so I will just ask you to mute your microphones uh, for this presentation. Uh, until the end when we ask for questions. For the past year, I've been giving updates on vision implementation at each board meeting. Today, NSB Chair Ellen Ochoa has asked the VIG to present a retrospective of year one implementation and a, propose, and a proposal for year two priorities, which I'll do on behalf of my fellow VIG members. And so I wanna just call them out and just thank them for their time and their patience and what they've won. That's Roger Beachy, Maureen Condit, Dario Gill, Julia Phillips, Alan Stern, and also the NSF liaison, Saul Gonzalez. And then I'd like to open it up to the rest of the board for your feedback and questions later on. And I wanna also thank my board colleagues for their support. In 2018, the National Science Board identified three trends that were threatening the nation's science and engineering leadership. The globalization of science and engineering, as we've all seen and read in the news, the growth of knowledge and technology intensive industries and the demand for STEM talent. We spent the next year and a half speaking with and listening to stakeholders from around the country about how to bring about the next era of America innovation leadership. We took that input and data from science and engineering indicators and developed a vision with a roadmap to guide the board, the National Science Foundation and the United States science and engineering enterprise in the coming decade. So what I'd like to do now, uh, particularly for some of our new members who have joined the board and for some of this before, you've seen this before, but I'd like to say, this is just to affirm how important the vision is. So for those tuning into the main meeting who may not be familiar with the vision, but also as a reminder to us all, I'd like to show this short video. America is innovation, and the National Science Foundation has helped our nation push the frontiers of science and engineering for more than 70 years. From silicon to photons, the cells that drive us and the impulses that move us, from the earth beneath to the stars above. Real, tangible progress stems from, well, STEM. If we want to ensure America continues to power that progress, we must ask ourselves, how can we keep our lead in fundamental research? How can we make sure American discoveries continue to empower economic growth and national security? And how can we increase STEM skills and opportunities for all Americans? In the face of increasing global competition, we must answer those questions by doing the following. Deliver benefits from research to help U.S. businesses and entrepreneurs succeed. Develop STEM talent nationwide to build the workforce America needs to invent the future. Expand the geography of innovation so everyone in the country can participate in and benefit from science and engineering, research and development. And foster a global community that attracts international partnerships and talent. The road ahead may be filled with twists and turns, but we have a map. Our vision for 2030. Join us in charting this new territory. Together, we can build the future of our country through the power of science and engineering. Thank you team for that video. And I hope you have enjoyed it. We've showed this many, many, many times before. And I can say that all the talks that we have, people are feeling the energy and kind of coming to this movement in terms of vision 2030. You know, the NSB released Vision 2030 at the May 2020 NSB meeting, and shortly after uh, she assumed board leadership, Ellen created the, the VIG to help the board set priorities and keep vision implementation on track. The NSB is close collaboration with NSF 
is working to implement the vision and every NSB committee is part of this effort. And uh, Ellen, I just wanna thank you very much for not only implementing this, but for your support and leadership of the vision implementation working group throughout. It, it has really have been visionary, it's been fun. And I think it's something that as we will go forward in the future, will keep us on track as we change. So let's talk about, next slide, please. In writing Vision 2030, NSB tuned into the long-term trends that we saw as driving the need for change in our science and engineering ecosystem. In the report, we synthesized and crystallized the active and thoughtful conversations that were happening throughout the s &E community and seized the moment to add the board's voice. But things have moved pretty fast <laughs> in the past year. Uh, we have a new president, we have a new Congress, a change in NSB and agency leadership. Congress has proposed once in a generation legislation for the National Science Foundation and for research and innovation broadly. The new administration likewise has new priorities. Some of those that you've heard about in yesterday's presentations. We released Vision 2030 when we were barely six weeks into a catastrophe, the likes of which the world has not seen in a century and which has upended all our lives for the past 16 months. COVID-19 has infected nearly 200 million people and left more than 4 million people dead worldwide, including more than 600,000 in the United States. Not to mention the effects of the pandemic on the economy, the national and global science and engineering communities. And these same communities and our society at large have been grappling with difficult issues around race and social justice. It is a moment of profound change, a moment shaped by loss, but also brimming with, its, with possibility. It is a moment when Americans in the world can directly see the critical importance and impact of science and basic research. It is a moment that offers us an opportunity for introspection, re-examination of past practices and assumptions, and reimagining what the future could like, including the future of our nation's science and engineering enterprise. More colloquially, many of us have adopted the term that this is a Sputnik II moment for our nation at this point in time. And so I and my colleagues would argue that Vision 2030 is even more relevant today than it was a year ago. Hey there. The so, um, so can somebody move the uh, mic, please? The imperative to develop and diversify our STEM talent to ensure that every part of the nation has a chance to benefit from and participate in our science and engineering enterprise and the need to address pressing national problems and priorities and the importance of international collaboration to progress in science and engineering are all key elements of the administration's pillars and the legislation under consideration. And you saw those pillars uh, displayed in yesterday's pre uh, presentation by the director. Here at NSF, our vision has facilitated alignment between the board and the new director's vision and delivered a framework for board oversight and accountability that we believe will ensure the success of what we hope will be an exciting new era for the National Science Foundation. So next slide. Recognizing that the board could not tackle the entire vision roadmap at once, one of the VIG's first undertakings was to prioritize areas to focus in on our first year of vision implementation. Considering factors such as the new NSB chairs and the new NSF director's priorities, congressional interest, and the desire to take a strong step out of the gate and a bold step I might take, we prioritized two roadmaps, delivering benefits from uh, research and delivering STEM talent for America, two of the four areas that are mentioned in Vision 2030. These priorities set our, set our agenda for committee activities throughout the year. So next slide, let's talk about some progress. And there was much. And since it's only been a year, of course, there's still much work to be done. But I'm very pleased to say that we've already started to see progress, which I'll take a few minutes to highlight. The board cannot claim credit for all of the achievements, but we have said that all along Vision 2030 is a call to action. Achieving the goals of the vision will require the participation of the National Science Board, the National Science Foundation, and everyone across America who has a stake in the American science and engineering ecosystem, working together in cooperative and complementary ways. Yesterday in his opening remarks, Director 
Ponchonathan highlighted a number of accomplishments in his first year, many of which contribute to Vision 2030 goals. We should celebrate any and all progress toward these goals. Next, first click. And I wanna thank you, Dr. Ponchonathan, for your leadership and advocacy, which has really caused us to really work together as both a board and an agency and realizing not only Vision 2030 goals, but also the strategy that you have laid out for the foundation. So one of our first uh, progress that we made is just messaging success. Uh, as you know, many people have said, it's really about three words, communication, communication, communication. For those of us on the board year one was about spreading the word. And then for many of us, some might even say the gospel about our vision. To that end, we conducted more than 25 Vision 2030 engagements with federal and state level leaders, as well as academic, scientific, and education organizations. We met with members of Congress and congressional committee staff. We engaged in both the previous administration and the current administration. Starting just a year ago in July, 2020, we heard compelling and diverse voices illuminate issues around developing our domestic STEM talent, particularly from the missing millions. Via external panels at each of our board meetings, these external facing efforts helped to disseminate the board's vision, galvanize momentum around key NSF priorities, elevate and understand the concerns of segments of our science and engineering community that are too often unheard and cultivate an existing and new partners. One of the takeaways from our engagement with these stakeholders is that Vision 2030 is relevant and others are adopting its record. Terms such as the missing millions, delivering benefits from research, benef bench to benefits and, Sp and the Sputnik II moment has helped seep into the vernacular of policymakers, educators and advocates and many of us across both the board and NSF. And I cannot tell you how many times that, you know, in just personal encounters with folks, people were talking about developing domestic diverse STEM talent. What about the missing millions? How do we get the go from bench to benefits? And so I'm glad that these logos, these sayings, these topics are getting out to the public uh, vastly and near wide. Policy successes. We've also seen progress in the policy area arena, including bills that have passed in the House and Senate that emphasize Vision 2030 goals of developing STEM talent, particularly domestic STEM talent, delivering benefits from research and expanding the geography of innovation. Uh, it is exciting to see this bipartisan enthusiasm in Congress for substantively enhancing investing in the National Science Foundation and as a part of a broad push to strengthen US science and engineering and competitiveness. And I wanna give a lot of credit to our NSBO team and to Ellen and our colleagues who are engaged with many of the members and committees. A lot of emails uh, early in January and February. Uh, we were actually, you know, uh, to be recognized that congressional committees uh, on a lot of these bills and their staffers engaged us, came to the National Science Bar, talked to the VIG and asked us, what are your inputs in here? And how does these inputs align with Vision 2030 as well as can make the foundation, you know, be able to address the times that we face? It, I mean, it was just incredible. You know, one of the major policy successes of the past year is that NSF is on the cusp of creating a new directorate or office aimed at delivering benefits from research. I mean, this is really, really, really huge. And as we heard yesterday, Ponch and Irwin and others are working hard to ensure that this new entity is successful. I also wanna call out our VIG member, Dario. Thank you for your help with that and uh, as a member of the VIG and working and for your inputs on the translation, innovation and partnership directory. Another policy success is that talent, the missing millions, diversity and inclusion are been top priorities for Congress, the White House and for the foundation. We've had many excellent discussions with Ponch, Karen Marangel, Rhonda Davis, and others on what NSF is doing now and can do in the future to move the needle in these areas. And I kind of know this personally because as I hear from a lot of folks in NSF, they really are appreciating the um, building of the environment, the recognition of diversity, equity, inclusion, and access as a real tenant 
that starts from the top from the 19th floor and works all the way down. Working closely with Susie Iacono, the board has also made progress on broader impacts, including passing two resolutions on, on training panel members on broader impacts and including a broader impact expert on the Committee of Visitors. Another board achievement in our new and meaningful relationship is with the Committee for Equal Opportunity in Science and Engineering, or as we all know, CIOS, which is a congressionally mandated advisory committee to the National Science Foundation because CIOS and the board share common goals around talent and equity, particularly when we talk about developing domestic, diverse STEM talent, we can support and amplify each other's efforts. And I wanna give a special thanks to board chair Eleanor Ochoa for initiating this outreach, which I think has very proved fruitful and puts us on a new course together with both CIOS and the board in terms of the missing millions and how we can do this through the National Science Foundation. I'd like to say, as Director Poncha Nathan says, is we are the agency that develops talent. And so this will really help. The board has several policy pieces focused on talent in the works. In addition, the board's messages accompanying indicators 2022 will be likely linked to Vision 2030 priorities. We already started this off with our new one pager that was premiered yesterday, presenting data from the newest indicators report that demonstrates the urgent need to improve K through 12 STEM education if we wanna cultivate the fullness of the nation's domestic talent as we call for in the vision. I wanna then give a special thanks to our VIG member, Julia Phillips for calling this out, for leading the charge in her committee and putting this on the table for NSB, I ask for our colleagues now and as we go in the future with Vision 2030, that K through 12 is something that we must undertake both as a board and a foundation if we're gonna critically maintain ourselves globally in terms of global R&D. Um, next slide, please. And this just shows you saw this yesterday in terms of the missing millions. You know, yesterday, Julia and Pont showed this updated version of the Missing Millions graphic, which now includes information on Native Americans, Alaska Natives and Native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islander and indigenous populations, and has been updated with new data from the 2021 edition of NCSES's Women, Minorities and Persons with Disabilities Report. The graphic serves as a striking reminder uh, how much farther we still have to go to achieve our vision goal of creating an accessible, attractive science and engineering enterprise that truly reflects the nation's demographic and geographic diversity. In a sense, how do we get par population parity if you look at this graphic here? And I want to say in many of our presentations, when people see this, they realize that while we've made progress over the next 10 years, we still have to make a lot more progress. Uh, particularly, for example, in our universities and particularly the representation of our STEM faculty. Um, those numbers have to increase greatly and vastly. And this is going to be a task that I ask of not only the VIG, but also with the board and the foundation. Next slide. As Ponch has pointed out many times, the alignment between Vision 2030's goals, NSS visions, and administration priorities is near perfect. This is a big win. And we saw this yesterday and you see how of all these things are tied together. And as Ponch said yesterday, budget follows strategy. But as Kaufman and Sorensen always says, strategy, uh, culture eats strategy for, for breakfast every day, which means that what we need to do is we need to, how do we can change the culture? Okay, and that's a duty of all of us in order to make sure that we can carry out Vision 2030 to make sure that the NSF vision is carried out and then to make sure that the administration pil uh, pillars are all interweaved. And so this causes us to make sure that we can do this all together. We've got to change the culture. I see that in the conversations among board members. I see that with Ponch and his team of assistant directors and program officers we are changing that culture because once we change that culture, then budget and strategy will follow. I hope you're encouraged by this retrospective and agree that we had a great first year. I think we did. And a year that has been a fantastic example of what we can do when all who have a stake in, in the US science and engineering research and innovation work together towards common priorities and goals. 
I also hope that you also realize that there is still much to do, which is what I want to turn to next. So the next slide. Lots of opportunities on the horizon. As the VIG discussed what the board should focus in on, on year two, we assess the progress to date and I've just described and considered the following current opportunities. Next slide, please. First, vision goals around the mission, missing millions and geography must align with NSF's and the administration's priority of equity. And we've heard that over and over again. Uh, and I'm starting to see that with the uh, things that are going on within the foundation. We're starting to see that in terms of the discussion on how do we engage uh, other groups, uh, HBCUs, MSIs, rural communities, community colleges. So the fact that that conversation is going on and going on consistently is really, really great. Second, the new TIP structure offers a tremendous opportunity to realize progress on delivering benefits in, from research. And I wanna thank you, Erwin, for an excellent presentation about TIP. Uh, we'll be holding your feet to the fire as the board as this goes forward. But it was really exciting what we're seeing with TIP. And we can say that TIP will be one of the legacies of Vision 2030 and the foundation. Third, like the board, the administration and Congress will want to access success by demonstrating impact, conducting rigorous evaluation, and showing tangible outcomes. And outcomes are extremely important. For us, it's not enough to just look at inputs and how much we have been authorized and how much has been expended. And that's part of changing our culture. But really is over the course of time, looking at those inputs, how did we change out? What are the outcomes? How did we move the needle? If, for example, in the missing millions, the figure that was shown previously, if that hasn't changed in 10 years, and even though we've expended a lot of money, then we're not getting reaching those outcomes, which means we've got to set metrics, both in, both, you know, in time metrics and both long term metrics. So we want to see the opportunities. Next slide. As I mentioned earlier in year one, the board prioritized in developing domestic STEM talent and delivering benefits from research. In year two, it makes sense to continue to prioritize talent and delivering benefits and to add the expanded geography innovation as a priority. And I wanna take a moment to explain why. And you saw that kind of yesterday when we had our community college panel, as we talk, as we start to pivot into expanding geography. And again, I wanna thank our board member, Jerry Richmond for uh, organizing such a great panel. Everything else depends on talent. And NSF is America's science and engineering talent agency. It is the only federal agency whose core mission includes formal and informal STEM education at all ages and stages. NSF is integral to creating the US STEM capable workforce we need for the 21st century. A workforce that includes everyone from skilled technical workers and we heard about that yesterday. Those are people who are post high school, but don't have a bachelor's degree. But as we know, constitute a major part, almost half of the STEM workforce and bring STEM based skills to PhD scientists and engineers. But we all know that more work is needed to provide pathways for all who find their passion and purpose in STEM. So we must work together to develop strategies and set goals for supporting equity and reaching the missing means across all of NSF's programs including in the new TIP structure. Delivering benefits. We all want NSF's new TIP structure to succeed. I surely do want to succeed. I think it's a very exciting thing. And it's something I hope we get behind because it can be a major implementation stepping stone for Vision 2030. And you only have one chance to make a first impression, as my mom used to say, because the first impression is the lasting impression. NSF is well positioned to leverage the synergies that come from supporting both discovery and use inspired research, identifying promising areas to fund at an early stage and to push the boundaries of disciplinary and interdisciplinary research. Building on these strings, we want to accelerate the path from imagination to impact by building capacity in translational research and strengthening partnerships between academia, the private sector, and government. 
And then that includes everybody from the two, the two folks in the garage, the startups, the VC community, all of the people who have a hand in setting up the innovation and research science and engineering ecosystem in the United States. We also want to keep up the momentum of the board that has generated around broader impacts. And remember that Congress will want to see results. Just like everyone else, whether it's industry or government, people now are understanding that outcomes are, are the key of the realm. And not just in 10 or 20 years, but soon. So we have to get this right the first time. In expanding the geography of innovation, it's an emerging priority for Congress and the White House that relates to both the missing millions and delivering benefits uh, from research. Over the past 70 years, NSF investments in research, science and engineering talent at all educational levels and commercialization and innovation have built science and engineering capacity in all 50 states and US territories and including the District of Columbia. As such, we're well poised for new efforts to further enhance the geographic diversity and reach of our science and engineering research enterprise and help to ensure that Americans from every state have access to high quality STEM education and science and engineering careers and including the District of Columbia's and US territories. Next slide. So, you know, how do we make progress in these areas and, and what we're gonna be doing in year two? If year one of vision implementation was about getting the word out and advocacy and letting people know that we had a vision and it's a vision that's not only just a vision for just scientists and engineers, but it's a vision for every man and woman who are on Main Street throughout the United States and starting conversations with NSF about its strategies for achieving vision goals in year two. So first of all, we wanna ensure that NSF has the strategies in place to set and achieve goals. And it was very uh, good to hear about the strategies are coming, that as we look at our budgets and as we go forward, we build that strategy in first. That we are proactive, not reactive. The next one is accountability and being able to, to measure progress. The VIG over a number of conversations this past month have gotten inputs from both our industry and government and academic partners who compose the VIG about metrics. We should be able to look at those things right away and say, hey, look, we did this and this happened, okay? We have to move away from anecdotals, anecdotal evidence and anecdotes. Those are nice, but we've got to have really hard data and metrics, which means we've got to really put really focus on gathering the data we need and baselining it. Also engaging closely with the NSF director as NSF stands up the new TIP structure. That's gonna be extremely important because it's gonna be fast moving. We can't afford to have an impedance mismatch between industry and government. And that's what TIP represents, an opportunity to get this right and to have that kind of engagement. And maybe also maybe have to change our language and welcome those at the table if we're really going to move out things at speed and scale. And internally, our NSF governance role and this means that the board, talking to all of you, my colleagues, will work with NSF to demonstrate its progress towards national strategic goals related to the missing millions, delivering benefits, and expanding the geography of innovation. We want to start with identifying metrics and obtaining baseline data on whom NSF supports, what NSF, what NSF supports, and where NSF investments go. Because if you don't know where you're starting, you don't know where you're going. We know this will be challenging and it will require some changes to our practices and processes, but I believe it's essential for holding ourselves and the agency accountable and measuring progress and sh sharpening our message to stakeholders, including our appropriators. It is something that we need to do as a board. It is our duty. We'll consult with the director on strategies, goals, and organizational changes to realize NSF's new TIP strategic priority. The creation of the subcommittee on TIP yesterday, and thank you uh, for that, demonstrates the board's commitment to ensuring that NSF can deliver benefits from research at speed and scale. And let me emphasize that again, at speed, at scale. It is really important that we see we can make these things happen. We will continue to re-examine or possibly revise the merit review policy 
This will include re-examining metrics, assessment and reporting around broader impacts. It will also require us as board members to think outside of the box. You know, as was said yesterday in our meeting, what we did and how we functioned when the board was created in 1950 is vastly different than what we have to do now. It's a different time. And we'll work with NSF to understand the agency's goals and strategy for avoiding undue concentration of basic research and education. Part of this should include partnering with NSF on its visioning activity on the future of EBSCOR. <clears throat> Next slide, in our external role as advisors and science and engineering thought leaders, we will use indicators 2022 to access progress toward critical national science and engineering priorities. We will communicate NSF success to Congress, particularly related to TIP, as well as we'll communicate that to all our stakeholders. And we'll continue to engage the science and engineering community on the vision. I want to call out Suresh Babu for helping us with the uh, Tennessee conversation we have. These type of forums are extremely important for all of our board members to do in all of your spheres of influence, including outreach to new groups and organizations. Think about it, things like the National Education Association and other groups that maybe we not traditionally have engaged while ensuring that we're complementing NSF's engagement with Congress, the White House, and other stakeholders. So next steps, next slide. I've laid out the high level priorities and focus areas that the VIG proposes for the board's second year of vision implementation. Many of them fall within the domain of more than one committee. To ensure that we're coordinating our efforts and working efficiently with NSF and communicating the same messages, the VIG suggested that each committee develop a two-year work plan to flesh out special committee goals and activities. The VIG will provide guidance and continue to help vision implementation and on track. And I will say that uh, listening in on the committees, you really inculcated a lot of Vision 2030 and carrying out what we wanna do in Vision 2030. I'm glad to see that those things are priorities in your committee work. So before I close, however, next slide. Gratitude is extremely important because if we're gonna make it together, it's really important to thank a lot of the people who've made this happen. And I also wanna, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge and thank all those who are working with us directly or indirectly, and those out there in the audience who have gone out and advocated Vision 2030 and for all the invitations and continuing invitations to, to speak about 20, Vision 2030 and the work of the board and to achieve the goals. So many thanks and first of all, kudos to our chair, Ellen Ochoa. Thank you for this leadership and commitment and I wanna humbly thank you for having me chair this. Um, uh, it's both an honor uh, to do this and uh, I do it with, with a lot of passion. So I, I thank you for that honor. I wanna thank my fellow VIG members, Roger, Maureen, Dario, Julia, uh, Alan, and Saul. And thank you for your thoughtful input since we launched the vision. And thanks again to Roger, Julia, former NSB members, Vicki Chandler, Maria Zuber, and former NSB chair, Diane Sylvain, for spearheading the development of the vision. I wanna thank our other committee chairs, vice chairs and committee members who took the vision and ran with it over the past year. I'd also like to thank John Vasey and the entire NSB office team who worked tirelessly to ensure that the board can effectively carry out. I'm afraid to, to mention all the names, but from Kathy, Elise, Raby, Alexandra, Portia, Michelle, Brandon, Faith, Anne, and I hope I haven't, and if I've, uh, you know, forgot anybody, you too, all of you all are incredible. Um, you do so much with so little. And so I want to thank you for what you do. I want to also give a special thanks to the president and his administration, as well as congressional leadership, especially Majority Leader Schumer, Senator Young, and the leadership of the Senate Commerce Committee. Chairwoman Johnson and Representative Lucas and the House Committee on Science, Space and Technology for their belief and in dedication to the American Science and Engineering Enterprise and their support of the National Science Foundation. To all of our stakeholders who reached out to us and accepted our invitations this past year, including all of the speakers on the featured panels at our meetings, 
like the excellent panel we had yesterday on community colleges and realizing how community colleges are an important role of our science and engineering research ecosystem. We appreciate your time and interest in Vision 2030 and all the work you do in your organizations, institutions, communities, your dining room and kitchen tables to advance science and engineering research and education. It is, we are extremely grateful. And finally, I want to extend the board's gratitude to NSF Director Ponch Nathan. Um, Ponch, you've done an incredible, over, over the time you've been here, um, Vision 2030 could not happen without the alignment you have with NSF strategy. We are truly grateful for your leadership of the agency. And at this point, the time that we have between the board and the foundation. And I also want to thank your leadership team. They have been just fantastic. Uh, that your leadership team, the ADs that you have, the fact that you've elevated others to be part of your leadership team shows your commitment that you really understand that it's about people who will make it work. And also all the NSF staff, from the dads, the ADs, the program officers, the program managers, the grant officers, for partnering with the board to achieve our common goals. Um, and I also want to shout out again for you, Sal Gonzalez, for serving as the, as the NSF liaison to the VIG. Your insights have been helpful. So I wanna close. I'd like to borrow Poncha's slide again to remind us that we're moving in the right direction and that we're ready to seize this moment, this Sputnik II moment of change and opportunity to release our, realize our vision for NSF and for the US science and engineering uh, ecosystem together. As I like to say, teamwork leads to dream work. We have a great team. So Lau, let's make the dream. Before I open it up for comments or questions, would any of the VIG members also like to add anything? I'll, I'll just like to, uh, you know, since you've given such extensive thanks appropriately, Vic, I would like to thank you uh, for your leadership. Uh, on this effort and the passion that you bring to the topic, which is contagious for all of us. So thank you for your leadership. Thank you, Dario. For the remainder of my time, my fellow VIG members and I would appreciate your thoughts on the plan for year two that we've outlined or anything else in the presentation. Wow, <laughs> stunning. <laughs> oh, Roger, I see your hand. Yeah, just to say that uh, it's really been uh, a lot of effort by, by Vic and, and the committee to, to move forward, but you know, we really need to know that the board is aligned uh, with the Vic team. And if there are things that, that you think that we've not made enough progress on or you wanna see more action on, uh, this is a time to mention it. I'd sorry to back up what you said, Vic, but really this is, uh, we don't get enough time to hear from the rest of the board and uh, we're going on a way that we hope is an alignment and if, if, if it's not please let us know because I think Vic's done a great job in, in getting us to where we are but we have so much more to do um, and somebody asked me if I if I if we imagined that we'd be this far along in the first year and the answer was no I didn't think we'd be this far along but there is so much more and and uh the, the piece on diversity I and mean, what we're adding this year, I think is an, an important component. But if we're not doing as much as, as you think we could, please please make sure that we know it. Thank you, Roger. And uh, Roger, I also want to, uh, again, I thanked all the members, but I want to thank you for constantly pushing us in the direction and saying, hey, look, we got to do better. Julia, um, I see your hand up. Uh, yeah, th thanks, Vic. And um, yes, thank you for your leadership on all of this. Uh, I just wanted to emphasize one of the things that this group has been spending quite a bit of time and I'd say energy on is the need for, as we move in new directions, developing appropriate metrics so that we can tell whether or not the things we are doing are being effective. Um, and, you know, you can't know whether you're making progress in a particular direction unless you know where you are now. Um, and that <clears throat> clearly is going to require collaboration between the board and the foundation 
um, maybe NCSES to some extent, but I think it's really more a board foundation thing. And that's going to be really critical in year two. Amen, Julia. Yes, we need that data in order to make the decisions of no, we're making progress. Artie, I saw you, your hand up. As we consider the missing millions, uh, we tend to focus on K through 12 education and graduate education. But we know well from the social science research that we support that there are many other factors that limit the ability, particularly of those who are economically disadvantaged from participating in the STEM workforce. I think we have to speak out more on those other factors. Uh, they're not contained for the most part within indicators. And yet if the nation doesn't face up to them, we will not achieve at the level that we need to achieve. So that policy side has to be even more active than you have indicated in your uh, summary. Thank you very much, Artie. Uh, Steve, you're next. Thanks, Vic. Um, I wanted to make a point that I think was best um, made by um, Steve Leith, uh, one of our colleagues. Um, we have the board from 1950 on created the preeminent scientific institution in the world, at least I think so. And as we work on diversity, equity, and inclusion, those contribute to the goal of having the preeminent scientific institution and are not at the expense of the scientific success we've enjoyed. Here, here, that is true. That is very, 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 very true. Uh, Jerry. Uh, thanks, Vic. I just want to um, say great presentation, but also I want to congratulate uh, NSF and, and the leadership, including Fleming uh, Krim, for the fact that I heard yesterday from a student that they got a, their postdoc ascend uh, grant. And, you know, that we talked about this as a, because of COVID and NSF, after the panel, NSF immediately jumped into action in order to put these, uh, expand the postdoc uh, program to uh, help students through this transition. So kudos uh, that this could happen so quickly. Kudos. Thanks. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. Thank you, Jerry. Appreciate that. And uh, kudos uh, uh, to the foundation for listening. Suresh Babu. Thank you very much for giving me the uh, opportunity to work with the implementation group and doing it in Tennessee too. Is there any way we can do the reach out to other states and uh, Vision 2030 across our country and then help talk to them about the best practices? Is there any thought process on it? I, I, I'll give you my thoughts and I love the board members. I think you just um, steal a line from um, Phil Nike. You got, you got to go just do it. I think in all of our states, we, we all can organize these things. Many of us are affiliated with universities, but those who are not even affiliated with universities, uh, one thing is there are chambers of commerce in all of our states. They would more than love to hear this uh, and be excited about it uh, and bring those people together. Because I think as we realize the confluence of both science and economics and national security, which by the way, if you, you know, I'm just paraphrasing the mission of the foundation from 1947, all come together. So I think wherever we have those opportunities, we have to be those agents of change to make it happen. Okay, we, we you know, we, we are, our NSBO staff is fantastic, but they have so much bandwidth. Uh, OPA is fantastic but they have so much bandwidth. But one of the reasons that many of us on are on this board, beside our passion for the research and science that goes on in our country is because many of us have reached out to our own networks, okay? And we can make that happen. And no matter how small or large it is, whether it's just convening students um, um, for a graduate course to talk about scientific policy and, and, or whether it's a larger gathering, um, we can do that. Many of us belong to scientific associations. Um, I belong to example for the American Chemical Society. 
Uh, we had a session with them and we will continue to have this dialogue and conversation. And by the way, with this kind of environment that we've had with the pandemic, we've actually been able to bring more people in. So I see many of the societies right now are talking about doing hybrid sessions, depending on what happens in terms of the progress of the pandemic, are reaching a lot more people. And they would welcome, I can't tell you, I would welcome a member of the National Science Board to come out, to give a keynote speech, to talk about Vision 2030, any aspects of it and how it relates to those societies. So those things we can do on our own. That's what I, I would expect. That's what we are ex expected as board members. We are called to serve. So we must spread the good news, which in this case is Vision 2030. Um, I'm seeing that I've been told to wrap up. So I'll take one last question and then I'd like to turn it back over to you, Ellen, if there aren't any. Okay, well, um, I wanna thank you all for your time. Uh, again, just keep in mind um, two things. As a team, we can make the dream. And as board members, we are called to serve and to spread the good news. So that is what we have. The good news is the vision. Let's go out there and do our job. Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Rick. And of course, I wanna add my thanks to the entire VIWG team, and especially to you, Vic, for your leadership, as well as the NSB staff who support this working group. Uh, you know, when we developed this vision, and, and of course, I wanna thank Roger for the, the push behind the whole vision, um, we knew it was more ambitious and comprehensive than uh, what the board normally works on. And so to have this working group activity, um, you know, it's really critical to help identify opportunities, keep the project on track, and coordinate the efforts of uh, all of the board committees. In the weeks ahead, I look forward to the VIG turning these priorities into an NSB work plan and collaborating with the board committees who have already done just a marvelous job um, so that they can each develop uh, work plans for year two. And of course, my thanks to Punch and the NSF senior leadership team um, for embracing Vision 2030. Uh, as everyone said, we're at an exciting moment, one in which the administration priorities and the NSF and NSB priorities align. And I look forward to the board's continuing prog uh, partnership with NSF and the administration to pursue these goals in year two and beyond. We've had uh, a lot of support from uh, so many science and engineering stakeholders, including uh, in Congress, who've also embraced these messages and engaged with us on vision themes and possible actions. And we certainly look forward to growing our collaborations as we tackle these challenges. <clears throat> I'd like to turn now to our next item on the agenda. Uh, this morning, we have the pleasure of welcoming former NSB member, Dr. Shirley Malcolm of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. The topic of her talk today is timely as the board considers how to advance our missing millions goal, including the promise to improve the attractiveness, equity and inclusivity of research careers. Dr. Malcolm's presentation may also inform our ongoing discussions to improve the effectiveness of the broader impacts review criterion. And of course, it was really a suggestion from the Committee on Oversight to bring Dr. Malcolm before the board today. So I wanna turn uh, the floor to Anila Sargent, the chair of our Committee on Oversight uh, for her to introduce Dr. Malcolm. I can't believe that I am still having to unmute myself. Um, I thank you very much, Ellen, and welcome everyone. Obviously, we're now well set for today's special presentation. But before we start, I'd like to ask board members and others in attendance to please turn off your cameras and mute your microphones during the presentation. And actually, of course, it's a great pleasure for me, and I'm sure for all of us, um, to have one of the nation's foremost experts on uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion in STEM um, here today. Dr. Shirley Malcolm uh, is at the 
an Association for Advancement for Science, where she is senior advisor to the CEO and director of its STEM Equity Achievement C, C Change program. In fact, Dr. Malcolm was also a member of the National Science Board from 1993 to 1998 and played a critical role in the adoption of the intellectual merit and broader impacts criteria for NSF's merit review that we now actually just take for granted. And a slightly longer biography can be found in our board book. Just before I begin, I'd like to follow, say that following Dr. Malcolm's presentation, I expect the board will have a lot of specific questions for her about building accountability for DEI diversity within NSF and its grantee institutions. I remind the board that there will be further opportunity um, for discussion of these issues in the Committee on Oversight open session this afternoon when NSF will present a summary of the 2020 Merit Review Digest. And with all that information, Shirley, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Anila. It's really uh, an honor uh, for me to uh, be with you and to be able to uh, share some of the uh, information uh, that um, uh, relates to the uh, to see change and to uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 review criteria and all the other things that uh, that we have uh, discussed. Um, I entitled uh, my presentation um, "Investing in Human Potential," and this is the title of an old uh, study that we did. Uh, long time ago um, to be able to talk about how to move forward. And I am not being able to sorry. That was hiding my one of the little clips was hiding my uh, my the, the button that I needed. Uh, it's an honor to join you. Uh, and I just want to uh, give you a brief overview of Sea Change uh, and the strategies that we're incorporating within Sea Change to really begin to, to move the needle. Um, NSF has been involved in broadening participation issues for a long time. Uh, the 20th century, century efforts uh, were very much a product of their times. Uh, initially, with the civil rights movement of the early 1960s, uh, there was a focus, for example, on supporting science within historically Black colleges and universities. Uh, this expanded in the 1970s to include uh, other institutions serving under um, uh, other uh, underrepresented groups at that time. Uh, there was a focus on, on individuals in terms of providing funding for interventions. Uh, and these were, uh, and also initiated in the late 1970s, uh, graduate fellowships for minorities. Uh, there was effort to try to understand the landscape. Uh, what was it that was giving us the numbers that we had or not uh, with regard to girls and women, as well as uh, ethnic minority, racial and ethnic minorities in, in uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And finally, we actually, uh, the foundation was actually supported, supporting intervention programs uh, in these fields for persons with disabilities. But the interventions approaches that were large, that largely dominated the strategies that the foundation undertook were, were limited in terms of what it was possible for them to accomplish. And this was in part um, because uh, the, the focus was on fixing the student, fixing the women, fixing the minorities, fixing anybody else, but really with little challenge to the structures that form the, the overall system. And that was the point where we knew that we had to be able to move forward. In a landscape review that we did at AAAS, uh, Marsha Mattis and I did back in the late 1980s, 
uh, in, in a publication in 1991, we uh, developed this model for meaningful change uh, to show that in fact, that much of what was going on were isolated programs, soft money funded, or with a lot of volunteer effort, um, it was dependent on institutional commitment. There was very little actually put in place uh, at higher levels within colleges and universities to start to move the, uh, the efforts uh, forward. And so we ask ourselves, why hasn't the needle moved? And it is because of, a, at a, in a, to a certain extent, our fixed section on fixing the people rather than fixing the system. The first thing that had to happen, however, was to an acknowledgement that there were institutional biases that were, that were in place that would keep the system from moving. We were all looking for approaches to try to catalyze systemic change. And one of the earliest ones actually came out of, uh, of MIT and the MIT, the MIT study. Uh, many of you have heard about the, the efforts of Nancy Hopkins uh, over the late 1990s. Uh, that it was, were able to demonstrate uh, if, in the way that little else possibly could, that there were systemic barriers. Um, these were, this was looking at the senior most women, the full professors who were by any stretch of the imagination, uh, highly capable, who were somehow feeling that there were differences there that they just could not grapple and couldn't get their, their hands around. And so when the study, when they began to study this, what they discovered was that there were differences. Yes, differences in pay, differences in recognition, differences in resources, differences in space, even among the women full professors compared with the rest of the faculty that were there. And a lot of this is described in the in the in the uh, uh, movie um, in the documentary "Picture of Scientists," uh, and I think that probably a lot of you ha have likely seen that. Uh, but it has been it was very useful in reminding us of the kinds of of bar barriers and challenges that were being faced at that time. And I raised this because it was the first time that somebody actually stepped up and said, we, got an, we have an institutional problem. Um, it is true that Bob Bergenau, who was the dean at that time, and Chuck Vest, who was the president, uh, moved quickly to remedy the situations. But they had this for the women who were, in, who were there. But they had this sense that they weren't the only ones with the problem. And so there was a reach out to, to other institutions and the creation of the MIT-9. But I will never forget the comment that Chuck actually made uh, that was covered in a faculty newsletter where he said, I have always believed that contemporary gender discrimination within universities is part reality and part perception. True, but I now understand that reality is by far the greater part of the balance. And it was this acknowledgement of the reality of bias that really allowed us to ha have this kind of discussion beyond, beyond MIT, because this was not the response. What happened to raise this at MIT was not the response of the disgruntled, but the call out for fairness and justice. So we began to see not only within the university community, but the few institutions, those within the nine and a few others who were starting to look at their own situations. Did they have the same problems with regard to pay equity or space allocation or resource allocation? And it was also around this time that NSF started advance that would allow uh, that brought forward resources that began to look much more in terms of institutional structures. In 2005, the UK, uh, with uh, again, very senior women frustrated at what was going on, uh, they founded Athena Swan. And they stood up a process that began with institutional self-assessment looking at those metrics internally to see whether or not there was fairness or whether there was bias. 
Uh, subsequently, in 2015, they, uh, they brought online the uh, UK uh, Race Equality Charter. And we, uh, in 2017, uh, adapted these charters, uh, the Race Equality Charter and Athena Swan, we adapted them uh, to form Sea Change. Now, Sea Change um, uh, is the newcomer in this block. Uh, the uh, Athena Swan has been around since 2015 and has been evaluated and has, has uh, uh, moved to help other places, other countries look at their, their situation. Uh, there is SAGE in Australia. Uh, there's Dimensions uh, that came after us in Canada. Ireland has a similar uh, Athena Swan effort and India is exploring an Athena Swan effort as well. Now, I remember I said that Athena Swan started in 2005, but the real uptake in Athena Swan happened in 2011. It was at this time that, professor, that Dame Professor Sally Davies, who was head of the, what their equivalent of the, in, of the National Institutes of Health, be, I think in a moment of frustration that things were not changing, really not changing, that she declared that in four years, uh, the, um, uh, the departments that came in to request funding would have to have at least a silver Athena Swan rating. All of a sudden, it got people's attention. And I think that this, the, that, the, that the government had a salutary impact on the departments really starting to move because they had four years to make these kinds of changes uh, and to begin this process, these processes internally. And it wasn't just the departments uh, because in order for a department to get a silver rating, this meant that the institutions, they could not move beyond bronze unless the institution had at least a bronze. And so this meant that it was moving the, in the discussions internal to the institution as well as <clears throat> inside of the departments. So the question is, what is Sea Change? Uh, sea Change is a, is a keystone initiative of AAAS. Uh, that tries to catalyze and sustain systemic institutional transformation. We're trying to create equitable and inclusive colleges and universities that uh, can support the success of all students and scholars. We try to build the capacity of individuals and institutions to really look at these things systemically, to take a systemic approach to change. We are research-based and metrics-driven. You cannot know where you, how far you have gone if you do not know where you have been. I will underscore that particular aspect the, of the comments that were made in the previous discussion. We provide a law attentive lens. Uh, we have uh, attorneys and policy experts who work with us because we, unlike the UK, have certain kinds of restrictions in terms of, the, of how we implement. And therefore, we, are, we look at elements such as um, what the, the state referenda, what do they forbid and what do they allow? Uh, the, uh, the judicial rulings, uh, for example, those in Gruder and Gratz, or those in Fisher one and two, they, you, we have to always be aware and attentive to how we can, can uh, develop and put in place uh, the kinds of, in, of efforts that will be needed in order to support systemic change. Uh, we leverage the institutional context, re uh, uh, with the context relevant design. That is that what has to be done in one institution is not necessarily what has to be done in another. It is basically, it depends on where they start from in terms of the kinds of things that they have to be attentive to. We not only look at race, ethnicity, but also gender in term and, and look at issues 
through uh, for women of color. We know that this intersectional lens is absolutely crucial because when you disaggregate the data, you will find that at the bottom of every graph that you will find will be women of color, whether that's the number of physics PhD, PhDs or, or what have you. Uh, and we put this, put in place a system, a structure, so that this isn't just one and done. You get the, the uh, recognition from sea change for five years. At the end of five years, you must come back in to re-up for the, up, for the uh, award level that you have or to go to the next level, to move, for example, from bronze to silver. And this is a way of supporting continuous improvement. And the, the umbrella that is there for sea change, the scaffolding that we provide, ask all of those questions. And the institutions really have to at least ask those questions of themselves about who, well, how are different groups experiencing the science programs that are in place within the institution. We use peer review as a way of, of, of addressing the applications once they come to us. We are not another intervention. We are not a check the box. We are not a ranking system and we're not a, a, a magic bullet. The uh, awards require deep self-assessment uh, and an evidence-based uh, action plan. Uh, it, as I said, it's, it's subjected to, to peer review. We have both institutional and departmental level awards structures that we are building so that we can get top down, bottom up interaction. We, AAAS, are building the institutional um, structures and we give the institutional awards. But we're working with disciplinary societies in developing departmental level assessments. The group that is furthest along right now is physics and astronomy. And in that case, it is the American, uh, uh, um, the American Association of Physics Teachers. It is the um, APS, American Physical Society, AIP, American Institute of Physics, Optical Society, National Society of Black Physicists, National Society of Hispanic Physicists. The idea is that they are the ones who look at, the, at building the departmental level structures because they build frameworks that are appropriate to those fields. And those are the kinds of, of things that really we have to pay attention to. It is not a one size fits all uh, kind of an effort. And as I indicated before, the awards are valid for up to five years. So self-assessment using detailed frameworks as scaffolding that we have adapted from uh, that uh, for the UK to the American context, uh, where institutions work uh, with a, um, a change team, a team of, 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 uh, of individuals from different parts of the institutions that have having to look at different aspects of the institution, whether it's the human resources policies, whether it's promotion and tenure policies, whether, but building on a base of institutional research uh, to see what, how do we stack up when we look at all of the things that we need to look in terms of equitable, inclusive environments. They don't have to put all of this into the, the uh, application. The application is a narrative that comes to, to AAAS at this point and rather the institutional boards where they tell their story, they uh, discuss what they plan to do and how they wanna be measured. Uh, then in terms of an action plan, this is what I'm gonna do and this is how, why I'm saying what I'm saying and this is, these are the ways that I will be able to tell that I have made progress. This is taken, into, as I said, into peer review. We have three levels of awards, bronze, uh, the criteria is from all awards. And this is to do a self-assessment, to collect the data, to be able to uh, determine what it is that needs to be done. Uh, silver rep representing progress that has been made and gold representing leadership. And that is that not only have you moved your own needle, but you're basically serving as a model for other institutions. Uh, membership in Sea Change incorporates different elements. 
we have an uh, sea change institute and these are this is an example of some of the uh, the programming that has taken place in sea change institute the reason i point this out is because um not all the institutions are going to have the the, the knowledge of the research uh, that actually relates to the things that they might want to undertake. And a lot of the, this effort was supported by the NSF, but we want to put it in a format that, that is then available to the research. We have a community component where there is opportunity for moderated conversations and for convenings and to build a place for discussion around the DEI principles. And all of this, the, the community, the institute, and the awards are all housed under Sea Change Protocol, which is our centralized uh, platform to support all of this. There is a biomedical component uh, that was funded um, as well, in addition to the NSF uh, support for our startup. Uh, and a number of, of important foundations. The real, real startup funding came from the Isaac Simons Foundation, who basically moved us from a gleam in the eye to, uh, to actually be able to offer uh, an initiative. But uh, the National Institutes of Health are supporting our work uh, around biomedicine. So the question, the bottom line is that we need systems transformation. Uh, we cannot, we can no longer just do a little patch over here or a little band-aid over here with gaping wounds because that's what we have right now. Sea change is research-based, data-driven, and people-focused. And the scaffold that we have allows for the institutions to, allows us to support institutional change, the, the kind of systemic change, um, the kind of of internal guidance for institutions to know where they need to go, what do they need to focus on, but the external affirmation. And it is the external affirmation that the NSF can use. It is the external affirmation that a parent could use to decide where I want my kid to go to school or a faculty member, a person who wants to sign on as a faculty member can use to, as an indicator that this institution cares about diversity, equity, and inclusion. We have a renewal uh, cycle of awards that'll, that supports this continuous improvement. Um, external awards like this, especially that require rigorous self-assessment and, and ongoing renewal, renewal, really cultivate the long-term commitment to, to um, DEI work. And again, provide this kind of external validation. It's an external signal in recruitment and hiring and in philanthropy. Um, we call it positive peer pressure uh, is connected to metrics that matter. We think that if some institutions uh, uh, are recognized in this way, that their peers are going to want to be uh, get this recognition as well. So, should NSF care about assessing systems? Uh, the needle hasn't moved a lot. Uh, we are still wrestling with the same kinds of issues as when I served on the science board and when I came to the AAAS many, many decades ago. Um, diverse, inclusive, and welcoming environments support quality science and innovation, and they maximize return on federal investment. I, I, it's, it's impossible for me to, to emphasize enough that places that where the climates are supportive and inclusive are places where the best work can get done. Um, so as the agency builds, uh, works uh, to build research capacity of, uh, across the full range of institutions, there is an opportunity, as it were, to bake in attention to these kinds of elements uh, as essential components of building a research environment that supports excellence in research. And so with that, I would welcome any questions.
Thank you. As usual, I'm, it's taking me a little while to come back on, but I am on. So surely I'd like to take the opportunity to ask you one question before okay. I pass it up. So my question is that you've had enough time. I can see what you're suggesting we do. I can see how um, great this would be to address what is a systemic problem. But what kind of feedback are you getting from the institutions about how they um, are finding the administrative burden of this particular program? Is it overburdening the system um, to their, is that what they feel? Um, are there, is, is there a problem in finding peers to peer review or is there a uniform enthusiasm for the program? I'm just asking you what the kind of feedback you're getting from people who have started started using it people who have people who are exploring it okay the first one of the first things they say is the administrative you know there's all this data collection and what have you and we prefer to do this other kinds of thing or this going to this is going to take too long and we prefer to do something that is short term mm -hmm. um, short term will not last uh, we will we've already been done that experiment Okay, we have done that experiment. Um, the administrative part is it, it can be it can feel daunting, but they're already doing a lot of the data collection already. Uh, they have to report into iPads. They're already looking at a lot of the uh, of these uh, different kinds of elements. If they've done accreditation or they're just finished accreditation, they have had to do this. They can mm -hmm. use a lot of the data, just pour it over into a lot of the other kinds of things. But the other part is that this was work that really needs to be distributed across mm -hmm. an institution because it is, in fact, related to um, the, the, the different kinds of components that, that happen. So that's one thing that we hear. We do hear it is just way too much work, all right? Yeah. Then we hear that, well, the pandemic hit, we can't, our budget, we can't afford membership. The membership mm -hmm. is basic, is pretty modest compared with, uh, and it is based on the operating budgets of the institution, but it's modest compared with what uh, is being paid uh, otherwise, but I b b remind people that if you can improve, for example, your student retention, you can, uh, your retention in these programs, uh, you can more than pay for what you're doing. <laughs> Okay, you're losing people like crazy. Yeah. This is the ship that's taken on water, you know, mm -hmm. and so this is uh, it, it, I think that it is a way of how you have to look at this, how, yeah. in fact, you are looking at this as an investment. This mm -hmm. is an investment in the long term strength and health of their enterprise. I, I, I think that 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 they got to shift. Ship that they look at. I, I, I actually am getting nervous because I see a whole ton of hands up wanting okay, to. Okay, I'll you. be quick. And it, and it was a fabulous um, presentation, but let me um, move it over. Ellen is going to moderate the discussion. And thank you again. It's just a great idea. We can, we, we'll go forward, I think, in some ways. But Ellen, will you take over at this point? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Thank you, Anila. And thank you so much, Dr. Malcolm, for a very, um, very informative uh, presentation. So let me start with Jerry. Great, Shirley, great to see you again. Uh, Good to see you. Um, Shirley, I want to be quick on this. Um, I really like the fact that you're collecting metrics. Um, and I'm interested in finding out if you're collecting metrics on the demographics and retention and finish completion rate of graduate students, because I've been pushing uh, the board to seriously consider that those, those people, those institutions that get funding from NSF need to report that kind of information so that we can compare them from institution to institution. There is Life Sciences Coalition for Next Generation Life Sciences, which is collecting this data, but it's just a small group, so it can be done. I just want to know if you've been doing something like well, that. Well, in our case, what we do is that we outline which is to, what data the institution has to collect for itself. In many cases, we do not look at those data. 
all right, at the institutional level. But the institution needs to look at those data because they need to be able to say something about this. When I worked on graduate education issues, I, one of the things I found was that there was almost no conception of retention in graduate education because people just assume when people disappeared that they in fact had just decided to go off hiking. I mean, I, I, but I, but the, uh, within the context, certainly within the context of department level review, where they're drilling down on things like retention, et cetera. They are looking, uh, the, in, the uh, institution has the opportunity to say, we want to focus in on this, but they have to collect the data to look across the board. Thank you. And it should be the responsibility of the graduate schools to do that. So thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> See, Steve Willard. Uh, thank you, Dr. Malcolm. Um, my theory is once a member of NSB, always a always member, a of, member NSB. of NSB. <laughs> so you're one of you us. Notice, you notice I kept saying we? Yes. <laughs> I like that. So, so help us think, if you would, um, broader impacts is very important to us. And we're thinking about ways that we can strengthen it, including data collection on the way out. Your comments to me were sort of focused on the individual. Do you have any thoughts or would you share them? later about how we might uh, push broader impacts and be able to understand uh, the results of those impacts as we collect our data? Uh, I think that what we need to ask people, <laughs> see, again, what we, you need to ask people is really about what were you trying to accomplish and what evidence do you have that you, it was accomplished? And that is, that, that's just that straightforward. And I, in fact, um, uh, I'm a big fan of broader impacts. I'm one of the people who stood it up within the foundation. Mm -hmm. And I think that it is a, a very important lever for change, for systemic change, uh, depending on how it actually gets used. And so I applaud your 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 efforts to start asking for measurement associated with it. Thank you. Let's see, uh, Mel, you're next. You're, you're muted. muted. Can you un unmute, Mel? How many, Dr. Malcolm, how many institutions have used sea change? What is the distribution of bronze, silver, and gold? And how many institutions have started and left? Okay. All right. We are a startup. I said that we only be, really began in 2017. And the first thing that we had to pilot was the awards structure. So we only gave out our first awards in I think it was 2019. And so that means that we haven't had that much time. If we want to look at impact, we look at see what happened in the UK during this time, because they have 15 years of data. Is that right? Yes, they have 16 years of data and they have had evaluations. And so in our case, we only have bronze institutions and we only have five of them because as I said, we had to pilot them. And they are, in case you wanted to know, Boston University, University of Massachusetts Lowell, University of California Davis, University of California Irvine and Arizona State. And those are the ones that we have right now. I will, would be happy to come back in 15 years. I'd be happy to come back in 15 years, but be happy to come back in 15 years and tell you how many golds and silvers and things like this. But we, as I said, we are a startup. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I did think it was important to point out that you also offer the opportunity for people to essentially join the community. Yes. Uh, without uh, diving into the, the, the full assessment to yes. take advantage of the conversations, best practices, right. try to understand how they might um, uh, be part of the, the awards program in the future. Yes, and the membership basically is is larger than that. It's about 13 institutions and they can be there for a while and figure out how to maneuver or learn from others. We're looking at these kinds of strategies. Okay, we'll go to Vic next. Dr. Malcolm, always a pleasure to see you again. Good to see you. Going. Uh, my question is, um, what is, have you engaged because this is so important, 
uh, a strategy to try to also get the to present this to the boards of the institutions, because as you know, everything really starts at the top beyond the president or the chancellor and try to get to the boards of these institutions. And how can we at NSB help you? Well, uh, we have not undertaken this. As a matter of fact, I was in the process. I have been promising my staff that I'm going to do a module that uh, for the institute that is just about board leadership uh, and yeah. how and why the boards ought to be asking these questions. Um, and uh, I still I still have a promissory note out to do that. Uh, I would appreciate. Uh, people actually talking about this to their own institutions. You can uh, the, to at least explore the possibility because I don't think we have a lot of time to waste. Your presentation on Vision 2030 essentially says that we are we are far behind in any case and really need to be able to uh, to, to stop wasting talent. The demographics are shifting. The, 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 uh, the leadership within science, I'm concerned, is shifting. And so um, if you can at least say to people, just look at this, it would be appreciated. Okay, well, I'll follow up with that with you. Okay. Okay, we'll go to Amelia and then Julia. And because we're starting to get short on time, um, may not get through all the que uh, questions. So feel free to use the chat to make to make comments or questions too. So Emilio. Um, Dr. Malcolm, uh, I agree completely with your emphasis on the structural problem that was there and not addressed for so many years. But I was I'm wondering whether the sea change is addressing the structural problem of guilds. Uh, I assume you're familiar with an analysis that was done by John Lombardi some years back of universities. And he characterized universities as being made up of guilds. I know. And there were departments being constituted as very close guilds, which are resistant to anybody, including the leadership of the university, telling them how to run their business. Yes, I know and, that. Uh, and uh, this is a, if that is not addressed, uh, by, and you've only addressed the administration of the university in trying to change things, we're probably gonna fail again, because, uh, because we don't think of ourselves as guilds, but we are. And certainly when you, when you run a department, you can see how it resists you know, the dean and, and the presence of the universities all the time. Uh, they think they are the authority on what is quality. Uh, and the disciplines function that way, like a, like, a, like a mega, mega guild as well. I totally agree with you. And that is the reason that we are building a structure that is top down and bottom up. We want departmental change at the same time that we're getting institutional change. And if the physics com and astronomy community are working together to say, this isn't acceptable that in fact, that the numbers have not moved in 30 years, that it isn't acceptable anymore in light of the kinds of challenges in Vision 30. That is what we hope. We also hope that the peer pressure between institutions if one of those, those um, headline institutions basically gets the award, it's going to be difficult for the other one to not go after it. And we want to use the guild structure basically as a positive peer driver. Okay. Juliet. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Shirley. It's great to see you again. Good to see you. Um, I, I was wondering, what, well, first of all, it appears to me that there are some pretty good um, parallels in terms of the process, the self-assessment, so forth and so on, with many things that are done in the private sector, uh, for example, in environmental safety and health, or in, in processes, Lean Six Sigma and, and that kind of thing. Right. And um, so I'm, I, and that leads me to ask the question, whether the private sector and the engagements between the private sector and the universities 
might be a way of, um, you know, conveying the value of these self-assessments and collecting the data um, and, and self-improvement and all of that kind of thing, um, as well as the private sector being a major employer of the yes. products of the universities. And therefore, um, I think that, that it might be um, beneficial to uh, work on seeing what you could do to get the private sector pushing for this as well. We are working on that. We are trying to get corporate partners. We are trying to, and we're also trying to influence private philanthropy because that is another way to basically put a lever in place to say that this is valued. This is valued. And we want to go to places where we know we can, can we bring in people that have been have experienced highly productive, highly successful, highly inclusive environments. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Malcolm. Thank you to the Committee on Oversight for uh, bringing Dr. Malcolm to our board today. Um, I'm sorry, especially Suresh and Maureen, that we didn't get to your questions. Again, feel free to use the chat or um, uh, other means by which we can continue this conversation. Well, if people have questions, they can just email me. Absolutely. I've been asking, answering okay. a lot of questions on email about all of this. Of course. I, I just know that I think the whole board can benefit you know, from, from what we hear. So we definitely want to continue the conversation. And I'm sure Anila will help do that as well. Welcome home. <laughs> So with that, I'm going to conclude this open plenary session and we will break now. We'll return in closed plenary session at 1.10 p.m. Eastern. And I'll ask uh, all of the board members to move to the coffee breakout room um, and be up there in about five minutes. Thank you. Okay, Phil, you have host to stop the screen. I haven't seen you in a long time, Ann. That's right. <laughs> okay, Madam Chair, we are streaming and recording. Thank you. And um, I'm going to turn it over now to Anila Sargent and the Committee on Oversight. And, and hopefully, Anila's audio issues have been resolved. We'll see. <laughs> Anila, you're muted. Anila, you're on mute. I know. I just thought to that. Part. I have to tell you that there's. I never have these issues on anything other than um, oversight committee calls. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Maybe I was not meant to be doing this. <laughs> anyway, um, I'd like. Do you want me to just? It, it sounds okay. I, I yes. got out in again. Okay. So I'd like to welcome everyone to today's meeting of the committee on oversight. And aside from me, the committee members are Vice Chair Steve Willard, Roger Beachy, Steve Leith, Carl Weinberger, Jerry Richmond, and Scott Stanley. And the Committee on Oversight is continuing its efforts to address the Vision 2030 goals for uh, broader impacts um, by making optimal use of merit, merit review metrics and data collection. And of course, their, the presentation earlier today from Sidney Malcolm provided much food for thought and no doubt action um, for us regarding how we ensure progressively better accountability or actually just consciousness and activity um, in awardees and their institutions. And so it's been very helpful for us. There's a lot of follow up for us to do. We've also, from the point of view of this meeting, been reviewing the draft merit review digest and the committee of visitors reports. And we've begun to identify highlights for the board overview, which we'll bring to you later in the year. 
In addition, our vice chair, Steve Willard, met with the, object, the Office of Budget Finance and Award Management to discuss enterprise risk management at NSF. And so I'm hoping that Steve will up, begin um, by briefly updating us um, on that discussion. Steve? Oh, that's an introduction. Sorry. Um, well, unless it seems to me that, Steve, that you're talking at this point. Did I make a mistake? Of course, uh, we can. Um, hmm, let me check this out. This is rather bewildering. Um, well, um, Steve, are you ready to update me? And was that, was, is Steve supposed to update me? Yes, yes. Why don't we move on and we'll come back to this. Yeah, I'm puzzled because he's not leaping around. Um, and so anyway, of course, I'd like to welcome officially our new executive secretary, Veronica Shelley. She joins us from the Office of Budget Finance and Award Management and has oversight experience at, um, serving as NSF's point person on the financial statement audit and GAO inquiries. So welcome, Veronica. And so to go right into our business agenda, because we're the last reporting committee, um, I request the formal approval of the Committee on Oversight's minutes from the May 2021 CO Open Meeting, which are on the pages 205 to 207 of the board book. Um, are there any um, corrections to the open session minutes? Hearing no corrections, the minutes stand approved as presented. And I don't need to ask you for a vote, we can just move on. And so now turning to the topic, one of our main topics today is the Merit Review Digest. We're actually joined today by Office Head, by Office of Integrated Activities Office Head, Susie Iacono, and Senior Staff Associate, Erica Risi, both from, well, uh, they will present highlights from the Fiscal Year 2020 Merit Review Digest. And as I mentioned in my opening remarks, the Committee on Oversight actually met last week and began reviewing the draft Merit Review Digest. We found a wealth of relevant information on the merit review process as well as on um, uh, broader impacts, and we will continue to engage and cooperate with the Office of Integrative Activ Integrated Activities on these topics. And I do note that board members will have an opportunity to ask questions themselves after the presentation. Following the discussion after the merit review presentation, the committee will vote on a recommendation to the full board to accept the 2020 Merit Review Digest subject to the completion of the board's overview, which we are still working on. Um, we will be drafting that and presenting you with it at a later date in the fall. And so at this point, I'd like to ask Susie and Erica to take the floor. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Sargent, um, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce or reintroduce uh, Ms. Erica Risi. She's Senior Staff Associate in OIA, and she's going to present the most recent results from the annual Merit Review Digest. Uh, she will also present new public merit review resources and give an update on our response to the February board resolutions on improving the quality of merit review. Over to you, Erica. Thank you so much, Susie. Uh, I'm pleased to be joining you today to update you on uh, various merit review modernization activities. Uh, as a reminder, the Office of Integrative Activities contributes to the modernization of merit review by enabling oversight and fostering adoption of proven improvements. To do this, we analyze data, do studies, launch pilot activities, and make data and information about the merit review process more accessible. As Susie said, I'm going to share highlights from the Fiscal Year 2020 Merit Review Digest, and I'll also provide updates on plans for the next biennial survey of PI and reviewer experiences, NSF efforts to disseminate merit review information to the public, and activities that we're undertaking to implement two merit review related resolutions passed at the February National Science Board meeting. 
Starting first uh, with the digest, every year we work with the National Science Board to publish summary statistics on the merit review process. The next digest will be published later this year, but here's a preview of some of the key data. Fiscal year 2020 uh, was obviously anything but a typical year. COVID-19 and the associated pandemic that took hold halfway through the fiscal year brought unprecedented challenges. Laboratories were closed, field work was delayed, and we were all asked to adapt to new ways of doing business to ensure ongoing research remained as uninterrupted as possible. And during this year of great challenges, NSF overall saw a 4% increase in proposals acted on and an 8% increase in the number of proposals awarded compared to fiscal year 2019. The funding rate increased slightly from 27% to 28%. Proposal volumes are still lower than they were prior to fiscal year 2019 when the bio and engineering directorates eliminated proposal deadlines for their core programs and saw the resulting and hoped for decrease in proposal pressure. To facilitate the quick response to COVID-19, NSF made extensive use of rapid response research proposals known as RAPIDs. These proposals differ from a more typical research proposal in that RAPIDs are only required to undergo internal merit review may only request up to $200,000 of support and have a maximum duration of one year. The proposal award and funding rate increases are largely explained by the increase in RAPIDs. And when compared to the average from 2015 to 2019, we saw an over fourfold increase in the number of RAPID proposals and a corresponding increase in awards. The fiscal year 2020 rapid proposal funding rate was over five percentage points higher than the average. The March 2020 passage of the Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security Act, known as the CARES Act, provided vital funding to the science, technology and engineering research communities. The CARES Act allowed NSF to support the nation's immediate COVID-19 research needs while maintaining ongoing commitments. With the additional support provided by the CARES Act and by drawing on base appropriations and other available resources, NSF was able to fund approximately 1,200 new research projects across all NSF directorates in direct response to the pandemic. That is nearly 10% of all awards made in fiscal year 2020. This tremendous pivot on the part of the entire agency and the research community is a testament to the strength and vitality of the US research enterprise. In all, RAPIDS made up 9% of all research awards. This is a significant increase compared to the five-year average of 2%. The COVID-19 pandemic placed significant burdens on so many individuals at all levels of society. There have been a lot of questions about the impact COVID-19 has had on the careers of individuals historically underrepresented in STEM and at vulnerable career transition points. The Merit Review Digest cannot provide answers to those questions. For a number of years, NSF has been monitoring an increasing trend of non-response to demographic questions by PIs. And just as a reminder, Demographic information is based on voluntary self-reported data from all PIs who submit proposals in a given fiscal year. So when we think about the impact COVID-19 may have had on the participation of women in the merit review process specifically, the amount of missing data creates a problem. In the gray segments of the bar chart, you see that in fiscal year 2016, 12% of proposals were submitted by PIs that did not disclose their gender. And that number is now up to 26%. And we have no idea whether men, women, or non-binary PIs may be over or underrepresented in the group of non-respondents. This has the effect of possibly obscuring the true trends in participation. And NSF does have ideas about various steps that we can take to improve response rates to demographic questions. So with that caution about interpreting the data, when we look at the proportion of proposals submitted by and awards to female PIs, there was no year over year change. Women submitted 22% of the proposals and received 25% of the awards. 
the funding rate increased from 31% to 32%. The COVID-19 pandemic is ongoing and we will continue to monitor if participation rates change through fiscal year 2021 and beyond. Like with the previous slide, the proportion of proposals for which we do not know the race or ethnicity of the PI has grown and is now up to 32%. So the data about participation of underrepresented minority PIs should also be interpreted with caution. In fiscal year 2020, the proportion of proposals submitted by and awards to underrepresented minority PIs was 6%, and the funding rate increased from 28% to 29%. Finally, we considered the participation of early career PIs. An early career PI is defined as someone within 10 years of receiving their last degree at time of award. For early career PIs, we see no change in the proportion of proposals. It remained consistent with prior years at 40%. The proportion of awards is also unchanged from the five-year average of 36%. Here, we do not have the same problem of missing data because we do have uh, the, the degree year for PIs. Despite the many challenges of the year, funding rates continued their upward trajectory that we have seen for the past few years. Uh, most recently, likely, as I mentioned before, because of the higher number of rapid awards and the higher success rates for those proposals. Here we see the funding rate trends for research awards to various subpopulations. The funding rate for all PIs is seen in the dotted line. And while there are fluctuations every year, the increases are seen for each of the subpopulations on this chart. As the board and NSF considers the important topic of expanding the geography of innovation, it may be useful to consider what data in the digest may inform the development of a broad strategy. Here we see NSF research support to US states the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico, normalized by population and grouped into ranges. In fiscal year 2020, 33 jurisdictions received less research funding than the national per capita. 18 of those are F score states. Because NSF operates through merit review, funding flows to meritorious projects wherever they may be located. And in general, more populous states with more research organizations submit more proposals than sparsely populated states and consequently, consequently receive more awards. Turning now to the biennial survey of PI and reviewer experiences, every two years, NSF conducts a survey of the 90,000 or so PIs and reviewers that have submitted or reviewed proposals in the prior couple of years. And this is the fourth such survey that we've done. While the Merit Review Digest provides annual summary statistics about the merit review process using data from NSF administrative systems, the survey helps us understand PI and reviewer perceptions of and experiences with that process. And we do use the results. In past surveys, PIs identified improving review quality as an important way we can strengthen merit review. That finding has led NSF to invest in additional reviewer orientation and develop resources for reviewers. And it's an issue that has been discussed extensively by NSF leadership and the board. And we've active efforts to try and understand the components of a high quality review so that we can implement targeted strategies to improve review quality. The survey will be conducted in waves, and most PIs and reviewers will receive survey invitations beginning in October. And we'd like to encourage all PIs and reviewers who receive the invitation to please consider filling it out. The survey is an important way for us to understand how well we're serving the research community and where we need to do a better job. We anticipate that the survey results will be available at about this time next year. Another priority for OIA has been increasing access to data and information about merit review, which will be housed on a new and improved NSF.gov website. Our Office of Legislative and Public Affairs and Division of Information Systems have been engaging extensively with the research community through surveys, interviews, user testing, and other mechanisms to understand the features and information that they want and need. 
in addition to a modern look and feel, the research community and NSF stakeholders have told us they want improved search capabilities. They want it to be easier to find the most relevant information, including new funding opportunities. They want resources that help them write strong proposals and learn more about NSF. While the redesign includes a lot more than just the merit of review content, I want to show you screenshots of relevant information that is already live and available publicly. Here you see the main funding and awards page. Whoops, let me back up. Here you see the main funding and awards page which is a jumping off point for searching for funding opportunities, accessing proposal and award policies, and finding information about NSF funded projects. A great resource NSF has developed is the NSF 101 series of blog posts, which provide PIs with useful tips about preparing proposals and working with NSF. For example, on the right here is an article about preparing broader impacts statements. NSF also publishes a wealth of fact sheets that provide up-to-date information on NSF, the budget, state-by-state -state funding information, and research programs. Over the last year, NSF has worked to improve how we extract merit review data for use in the digest and for other purposes. We've developed repeatable processes that ensure consistency, accuracy, and validity of the data and make that data available for broader use. Earlier, you saw a preview, preview of the public dashboard, which is yet another resource NSF is developing for increased transparency and to answer basic questions about NSF's portfolio. The dashboard as it grows can be used to make the data from the Merit Review Digest available in a more dynamic format. So other than the dashboard, everything that I've shown you is live today. We're entering a new phase of the website redesign where we will incrementally migrate content from the existing NSF.gov pages to the new website. Both will live in parallel for now with a full cutover to the new site tentatively targeted for the end of this calendar year. And finally, I want to touch briefly on the work NSF has underway to address two National Science Board resolutions passed in February of this year. Both resolutions are aimed at making improvements to the review of proposals. The first resolution requires NSF to implement policies to maximize reviewer preparedness. The second resolution requires that NSF develop a plan to include broader impacts experts on committees of visitors. The Merit Review Steering Committee, which I co-chair along with Alan Tessier, the Deputy Assistant Director for the Directorate for Biological Sciences, is charged with coordinating implementation of these two resolutions. Along with committee members, Jean Feldman, the head of the NSF Policy Office, Karen Santoro, Assistant General Counsel, and Christina Fryman, evaluator in NSF's evaluation and assessment capability, we're making progress on these two resolutions. For the first, we're exploring whether there's evidence that watching the NSF reviewer orientation video is associated with the writing of higher quality reviews. For the second, we're developing resources to assist COV organizers with adding broader impacts practitioners to COVs. We will then analyze differences in the reports written by COVs that were required to include broader impacts practitioners with those that were not. And we look forward to sharing the results of these analyses, which will help us make evidence-based recommendations for this important area of NSF policy. Preliminary results are expected in the winter. And with that, uh, thank you very much for your time today, and I am happy to take questions. Thank you very much um, for your um, presentation. Um, 
and before I turn it over to the board members for questions, I have just one question that came up in our meeting. Um, the, the digest shows that the NSF program officers and division leadership are finding it harder to complete um, proposal reviews within the six month goals. But um, we actually are, you know, going seeing changes and huge improvements in and various other um, programmatic staff demands on time. And does NSF expect to have the resources to meet its dwell time goals and make progress in new areas? Um, so NSF strives to inform 75% of PIs of the award and declination decisions within six months. Mm -hmm. um, actually, prior to fiscal year 2015, the target was 70%. And as you know, in recent years, there have been a series uh, of shocks and uh, including the move to Alexandria, which covered the 2017 to 2018 timeframe, a government shutdown in 2019, and most recently the pandemic. And that led NSF to consider sort of what management flexibilities existed and were at our disposal to help our workforce manage those disruptions. Um, and during those times, NSF deliberately chose to prioritize processing of award actions over declines, uh, and which had the, the subsequent impact of, of making it uh, more difficult to meet the dwell time. Okay. And we believe that this is a balanced way to alleviate pressures on our workforce while continuing to ensure that the funding reaches the research community. So uh, as we move you know, towards this new normal, whatever that that might look like, we are making plans. Um, yes. yeah. so I think the overarching assumption that we're making as we think about those plans is that we are we are going to be operating in a world of increasing pro proposal volumes. Um, right. And we also remain committed to continuing to address new priorities, uh, address issues of equity, helping institutions with less experience navigate NSF um, and federal requirements. So we, we are considering pilots uh, and yeah. those would be robust studies. For example, we're looking at piloting a different- uh, can I, can, yeah, I, I'm delighted that you're working on this, but I see that I have limited time and several questions. So don't let's just dwell on this question. In fact, I see the chair has a question. <laughs> uh, <Ellen. laughs> Oh, thank you, um, Anila. I, I actually have two questions. First of all, I just want to say, Erica, thank you. Very, very um, interesting and good overall presentation. I learned a lot. Um, so two questions that came out of that. Um, you know, we know bio and engineering eliminated deadlines um, a couple of years ago and, and have seen sort of the desired result in terms of fewer proposals and higher funding rates. Is there any, was there any downside to that? And if not, just curious if, you know, other directorates would be considering that. So that's one question. Um, the second one has to do with um, the, one of the questions you're asking regarding one of the resolutions that we passed, which was um, the training video. And I, it looks like the question that you're gonna be following up on has viewing the video, is it associated with higher quality reviews? So that, that is certainly an overall uh, goal of the video. But one of the things as a board that we were especially interested in was there is a section on implicit bias. And so it seems to me there should be then a follow-up question uh, of the same kind of comparing those that watched it that with didn't and whether, that, whether or not that shows up as um, potentially getting around some of the Im implicit bias. Sure. Um, okay, so first, in terms of deadline, uh, in 2020, size did eliminate proposal deadlines for some of their smaller proposals. And I, it is still an area of active conversation in, in terms of programs that are, are considering expanding to the use of no deadline. Downsides, um, I, I think that the, the downsides that I've heard about are more that it requires a different way of managing uh, the creation of panels and finding reviewers. So it changes some of the, the internal processes that are necessary for NSF programs to manage the merit review process. That's probably been what I've heard of as, as the, if you wanna label it a downside, a downside. I, I would think of it more as just a shift that needs to be managed. Um, 
Now, in terms of the, the video, you are, uh, you're absolutely, it's, it's a spot on point about the, the role of the kind of the, the emphasis that the video uh, places on um, strategies for mitigating implicit bias. And I do think it's an area that we are talking about and how we could go about measuring that um, in a way that, that has integrity and, and is, it, it has data that we can use to back up our findings. So that's, that's something that we are talking about. And certainly if there are, are suggestions or ideas about how that might be done, we, we'd be delighted to hear them. Thank you, Erica. Thanks. So um, Jerry, you, uh, you yes. had a question. Thank you. Uh, two quick questions. Well, they may not be quick, but I'll ask them. Um, so there's a lot of ambiguity in the community about what percent, what weight you put on the broader impacts evaluation. Uh, some people see it as 50%. Some people see it just over the borderline if you're uh, with regards to relative uh, intellectual merit. Can you comment on what the uniformity is with regards to what your program officers tell reviewers and what's in the video about how much, what percentage of the total evaluation goes to an evaluation of broader impacts? Yeah, so uh, so I'll I'll start, and Susie, please definitely jump in if there's something else that you want to to emphasize. So we do not proposals are reviewed holistically as an entire uh, as an entire project, and the intellectual merit and broader impacts are both vital to uh, to a proposal's um, ability to be competitive when reviewed. So there is no there is no weighting of any individual criteria. Not neither is is more important, less important. They both must be present and both must be very strong. Well, that was pretty ambiguous. Uh, what do you have to say, Susie? Yeah, so um, that's how we train all of our program directors uh, is to do a holistic review of the proposal. And that's something that we have worked on with the board over the years, Jerry. Um, and it's something that we're, um, um, you know, uh, it, really serious about is not having individual marks the way that other agencies do and, and, and numbers because, um, or numerics that we have to obey. Uh, but instead, uh, we give all of our program directors and division directors great autonomy in how they do their portfolio balance. And so it's not like a score that you get. And that when you say weights, that's what it makes it sound like like you get a score, but we don't do scoring at NSF the way that NIH does. And so the confusion that's out there might in part be due to that, that some other agencies do give weights to different um, uh, criteria. And we decided way back when with the board that we weren't going to do that um, and that we were going to do a holistic review uh, with experts um, in panels, experts as our program directors, and then doing portfolio balance before we make recommendations for awards. Well, thank you. Number two, um, recently it was uh, NIH reported that they have been tracking uh, sexual harassment issues and what, pr what grants have been turned down because of the sexual harassment issue. And I noted in the article that highlighted this that NSF came back to say they are not tracking it. Are we not tracking that? I, so I, I'm not sure if Rhonda is on is on the uh, the Zoom or not. This is not something that I personally have, have knowledge of, and so I'd have to I'd have to go phone a friend to. I don't want to hold this all up, but does, do you agree that this is important to be tracking it? It is. I, I think obviously the issue of sexual harassment is 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 a problem, and it's critically important that we are addressing appropriately and tracking it. I, I, I can't speak to it. I really don't know how, I don't know the details of how it's reported, I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay, um, okay well, thank you um, for trying. And we'll, we should keep track of, we should keep track of your question, Jerry. Um, and then I see a, one last question from Steve. Is it a quick question, Steve? Yes, ma'am. Uh, the question is about the rapid um, grants. It's crucial that you know, we have accountability and the ability to oversight, oversee and audit. Um, I know the amount is small, but what is the proposed uh, arrangement for documenting rapid grants? 
So the, the, the actual documentation is the same, the, uh, you know, in terms of the, the jacket and those and the rapid proposals do are included in the subs in the sample that is available for a COV uh, to review uh, when those COV reviews happen. So it is it we, we do have oversight over rapid proposals and the jackets do have the, the documented decision and rationale. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, too, Steve. Um, so with that, I think I see no other questions. Do I have additional questions? Not, not from the board. There isn't really much time, but I would entertain one question. Doesn't seem to be anything. OK, so thank you, Susie and Erica, for joining us today, as usual. Yeah. Nila, uh, Karen, Karen wanted to respond to something, just in, uh, if it's okay. Excuse me, you did? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, no, thank you, Anila. Um, Jerry, thank you for the... <laughs> See you, you didn't come up on my... Uh, no, I, I didn't raise my, my Zoom hand. Oh, that was um, my, I can't, yeah, okay, <laughs> yeah. Just wanted to respond to, to Jerry's question, which is, which is a really good question. Um, we, um, I think, as Erica pointed out, you know, we um, we are going to be collaborating with Rhonda. I think this is part of our whole of NSF approach to um, to work around diversity, equity, and inclusion, and um, and we'll be working with Rhonda to to think about how we do continue to track issues like the one that you've raised, along with a whole host of others, and then think about what is the, the you know, the proper way to, to address and deal with those, um, with those issues and what, what can and should be reported and what shouldn't. So this is certainly in our, in the, the broader thinking that we've been doing around the whole host of issues around diversity and inclusion. You know, I think that's that's wonderful, uh, Karen, and I think you should make that public because uh, as a member of the National Science Board, it's very embarrassing to have it said it's not being tracked um, and doesn't reflect well on NSF. So being able to track and make those numbers transparent as NIH does, I think would, would, be, would be super. But thank you that, to hear that you're working on it. Okay. So thank you again, um, Susie and, and Erica, for um, a, one, a good and informative uh, presentation. And I will return now to the, um, the fact that we are actually already on the committee drafting an overview, and um, we expect to underscore the importance of articulating goals and developing appropriate metrics um, that will enable us to the, the digest to actually future digests will then demonstrate progress towards these particular goals using these particular metrics. And if anyone, does anyone have any specific trends that they would like us to highlight? I think we've already heard um, from Jerry some of them, um, or themes to raise in the overview. And if you can't think of them right this moment, it, please, please send them uh, to me and to Steve and to Ann Bushmiller because we'll be happy to discuss them as well. Discussions are going to go on over the next couple of months and for the overview, and we really do welcome suggestions. So do I have any pressing thoughts from anyone at the moment on the committee or, or not on the committee, on the board? I'm going to take silence as everyone is going to send me something. I hope they will. And so I now I'm going to ask for a motion um, to recommend the, the Merit Review Digest, as in our board book. Um, I act for a motion to recommend the Merit Review Digest um, for board approval. That is that we will send it up to the board. Following that approval, we can, um, and following the completion of the overview and the approval, I hope, of the overview from the board, the full document will be published on our website. So I ask for a motion now to recommend um, the approval of the Merit Review Digest as it stands at the moment. So moved. Second. And there you are, second. Thank you. Okay. Oh, um, so I have a, a movement and a second. So um, committee members should vote. And are all in favor, please say aye. 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 Um, um, any um, negative votes? Any no's? No. Any abstentions? No. 
So um, I think that the motion is carried that we that we recommend the merit review digest to the board and they may decide to approve it or not later in this meeting. So um, moving on from the merit review digest to um, um, a very similar topic, of course, which is part of our concern there. We're going to have an update on the, on what's going on at the NSF as a whole in the matter of diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. And joining us now are Karen Marangel, the Assistant Director for Education and Human Resources, Rhonda Davis, and um, Javier Inclan, the Office Head and Deputy Office Head in the Office of the, oh my gosh, in the Office of Equity and Civil Rights. And as well, we'll have Wanzi Gardner, the office head and chief human, cap human capital officer. People have such long titles, at NSF, in the Office of Information Resource Management. So they're going to update us on the achievements of their offices in addressing these um, vital issues, the work that they perceive remains to be done, and what they perceive as the path ahead. Um, both OECR and OIRM, I hope you remember the whole things by this point, will be vital resources in CO's ongoing work on, on broader impacts, broadening participation, delivering benefits from research, and including the missing millions. So this is, especially in the light of our talk, um, our presentation from Shirley Malcolm this morning, a very timely presentation. And thank all of you, Karen and your cohorts, um, for joining us. The floor is yours. Anila, I'm just going to take a moment to just make a small edit. Karen is representing this as a chief operating officer of the agency, uh, because I want this to be that this is agency-wide thinking about this very important topic. It's a minor yeah. thing, but since it is open session, I want everybody to understand that a role as chief operating officer is uh, important. Thanks. I'm glad that you brought that up, Pench, and I think that is possibly the most important role that she had, but somehow among all the other titles, that one didn't get included <laughs> in my talking points. I'm very sorry. <laughs> okay, we, there are too many, of, I understand from my past life how long these titles all can be. So anyway, let us move on to the presentation, Karen. Thank you. Thank you, Anilia, and, um, and thank you, Punch. And it, it really is an important point that the work that we have been doing and, and in collaboration with all of you on diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility in STEM is truly agency-wide. And part of the challenge of this work is that there is a lot going on in all corners of the agency. So I'm very pleased that Rhonda, Javier, and Juan Z are going to describe our diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility landscape that we have uh, really constructed to date, uh, including the racial equity task force that the director initiated last year. As I said, there are many initiatives in this space at NSF and much work has been done over the decades in this area. Today, we're going to start to pull all those pieces together for you and describe how we are responding in particular to a series of White House initiatives and using our internal levers to close talent gaps. I also want to reinforce how NSF is, is taking a leadership role in furthering the administration's priorities. For example, Rhonda is the NSF representative to the White House equity team. She also serves on the White House Gender Policy Council, and Javier serves on the White House Coordinated Interagency Working Group for Women and Girls Education and Leadership. And Javier was recently named co-chair of the NSTC Interagency Working Group on Inclusion in STEM. Wanzi is working with his fellow Chief Human Capital Officers, or Chicos, um, on the Chico Council to make our regulations, processes, and procedures more inclusive so that our workforce reflects the diversity of our nation. The effort that Wanzi's been working on is not a project, but a process that will be integrated in all efforts of human capital management, design, and implementation. And additionally, NSF leaders are providing guidance and assistance to other federal agencies due to our recognized expertise in this area. Taken together, 
You can see that NSF is engaging in some very exciting efforts around diversity. This includes the development of metrics that will allow us to measure the impacts that we are able to make on diversity in STEM. It is my pleasure now to turn it over to Rhonda Davis. Thank you, Karen. And also thanks for the opportunity to provide an update on, on NSF's diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility initiatives. And also an opportunity to share that Dr. Panchanathan and the leadership in NSF's commitment to these initiatives are second to none. Today, you will hear from myself, the head of the new office, the Office of Equity and Civil Rights. We recently renamed the Office of the Reorganization. Uh, we replaced the name of the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. You also will hear from Herrera Inklin. He's the deputy head of ECR, is the acronym we use for our office. And Wansley Gardner, who's the head of the Office of Information Resource Management. He's a Chico, and he also holds the title of co-chair of the Racial Equity Task Force. Next slide, please. I'm not, Thank you. So our agenda for today, we will provide a recap from our last briefing on diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, executive order 14035 overview, racial equity task force update, and DEIA highlights closing remarks and room and time for questions. Next slide. Since our last briefing, we have one new employee resource group this is in addition to the one we shared with you know, the ones we shared last time, Blacks in Government, LGBTQ+, Los Amigos, and a new group is the Mental Health Advocates Group. Each group is very active and fully engaged in on, with us on how to achieve equity for their respective members. I would like to also share an update regarding ECR's capabilities since our last meeting. We have expanded our role to engage the rest of the foundation on diversity related efforts external to NSF. As Karen just mentioned, Javier and I co chair several initiatives relating to equity and program delivery for the agency. Previously, ECR was internally focused on employment matters as it relates to diversity and externally focused on awardee compliance matters such as Title IX. As a part of this new role, we look to establish central portals, what we call one stop diversity to shopping concept where anyone could go to one location to obtain information related to all of NSF's diversity efforts. We have increased our staffing and contractual services to align with our delegated authority. The office now has a senior executive level deputy office head who brings an abundance of executive level capabilities to the office. Our harassment term condition updates continue to evolve. I shared last time about the contingent efforts that a team across the foundation has been working on a weekly basis beyond what we have already put in place around the harassment term and condition notification, research experiences for undergraduates and the conference policy. The team is currently considering how we can appropriately address harassment for other NSF funded award types to include travel proposals, postdoctoral fellowship program, the Small Business Innovation Research and Small Business Technology Transfer solicitations. Also, I'd like to share that we are fortunate that we were out front on initiating our equity efforts. Beginning last year with the Racial Equity Task Force and numerous others like the strategies that, we are, that are complementary to your Vision 2030 plan, specifically focused on the diverse domestic STEM talent and the missing millions. As a result, other federal agencies, OMB, have requested several briefings on our equity efforts. They are excited to learn of the promising practices we are implementing around equity. Because we're so far out front, we're finding ourselves recalibrating our schedule and scope to make sure that we're continuing in alignment with the administration's priorities around equity that were issued beginning this past January through several diversity and inclusion executive orders. In many instances, the work we've already done is enhancing our ability to appropriately respond to the executive orders. And in other instances, the scope of the executive orders are much broader. 
Therefore, we are recal recalibrating some of our efforts to meet the spirit of the orders. In a holistic manner, we are beginning to enhance our external diversity metrics by considering ways to move from an internal inward-driven focus to an external outward-driven one. For example, what I mean is that we have traditionally considered the amount of funding levels of various diversity efforts and programs as an indication of success. We're in the process of considering success around the impact the various programs have on diversity in STEM. And we also are seeking ways to make impact while we have a direct lever. Punch also established a team to leverage existing efforts and prevent unnecessary duplication while implementing the DIA equity initiatives. At this time, I will turn it over to Javier who will share more on our DEIA efforts. Javier. Thank you very much, Rhonda. There has been much activity in the diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility space at NSF over the past year. It started in September of 2020 when Dr. Panchanathan established the NSF Racial Equity Task Force. A few months later, the new administration began issuing several executive orders that are broader in scope and take a government-wide approach. The first three executive orders focus on mission. Executive Order 13985, Advancing Racial Equity and Support for Underserved Communities Through the Federal Government. Executive Order 13988, Preventing and Combating Discrimination on the Basis of Gender Identity or Sexual Orientation. Executive Order 14020, Establishment of the White House Gender Policy Council. And the last one, Executive Order 14035, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and accessibility in the federal workplace focuses on people and culture. This slide illustrates a timeline for the various initiatives mentioned in the previous slide. As you can see, there have been several significant executive orders regarding DEIA issued in a very short period of time since January of this year that require a significant amount of work, which I will detail in the next two slides. Despite this amount of additional work, the issuance of these executive orders is good news. I would say great news, and we welcome them. The work that we have been doing and continue to do in DEIA is good work, good government work that we are excited about. Why the excitement and why welcome additional work? Because these executive orders provide us an opportunity to look at DEIA issues holistically and simultaneously across NSF both from a mission perspective and a people and culture perspective. In January of this year, Executive Order 13985 was issued. This executive order directs agencies to identify methods to assess equity and allocate federal resources to advance opportunities for underserved communities. As part of this executive order, NSF established the NSF Equity Team, consisting of 14 leaders across NSF and is co-chaired by Rhonda Davis, and Peg Hoyle. NFF, NSF has submitted the required 60-day and 90-day progress reports, and we are on track to submit the required 200-day re progress report by next Monday, August 9th. In addition, NSF will submit its action plan for addressing inequitable barriers in agency policies and programs by January 19th of next year as required. Executive Order 13988 preventing and combating discrimination on the basis of gender identity or sexual orientation was also issued in January of this year. This executive order requires agencies to ensure all persons receive equal treatment under the law, no matter their gender identity or sexual orientation. And in March of this year, Executive Order 14020 established the White House Gender Policy Council and required agencies to take certain actions. Rhonda and I, as mentioned by Karen before, serve as NSF's senior designee and secondary designee to the Gender Policy Council, respectively. And our NSF team includes an additional five members from across the agency. The Gender Policy Council meets monthly and seven interagency working groups meet periodically. They are women's health and rights, gender-based violence, women's economic security and labor force participation, climate, women and girls education and leadership, science and technology, and safety, justice, and dignity. This executive order also requires agencies to submit their input to the government-wide gender strategy 
which NSF did on June 22nd. Later this month, agencies will review the draft national strategy report, which once finalized will be sent to the president. And finally, there is executive order 14035, which was issued in June of this year. While focusing on the people and culture of agencies, the purpose of this executive order is to build on laws and practices that prevent discrimination in the workplace and to consider potential avenues to establish additional procedures that advance DEIA priorities across the federal workforce. The expected outcomes are for agency workforces to reflect the diversity of America and to leverage inward facing employment policies and practices to ensure public servants at all levels have an equal opportunity to succeed and lead. This executive order asks agencies to look inwards to human resources and employment policies and practices to ensure that individuals who are members of underserved communities have an equal opportunity to thrive as public servants. The key components of this executive order include taking a whole of government approach to DEIA by executing a government-wide initiative to advance DEIA, require agencies to develop equity assessments of human resource policies and procedures within 100 days, for which we received guidance just this morning, and seek opportunities to establish a position of chief diversity officer as distinct from an equal employment opportunity officer. Building a diverse pipeline into public service by forming new recruitment partnerships and providing federal employment for formerly incarcerated individuals. Working towards pay equity by providing fair compensation and reducing reliance on unpaid internships. Equity for LGBTQ plus public servants. Equity for individuals with disabilities. Equity focused training and development. Providing a safe workplace by working towards the elimination of workplace harassment and gender-based violence and executing a data-driven approach to advancing DEIA. There are a number of deliverables and deadlines as part of this executive order, as you can imagine. By October 4th of this year, agencies will submit self-assessments of DEIA practices to the Domestic Policy Council, Office of Management and Budget, and Office of Personnel Management. By November 23rd, the DEIA initiative will issue a government-wide DEIA strategic plan. And by March 23rd of next year, agencies will submit agency-specific DEIA strategic plans that align with the previously mentioned government-wide plan. In addition, agencies will submit progress reports on an annual basis going forward. To ensure compliance with this executive order, agencies are required to establish DEIA implementation teams, which will include senior leaders from across the agency. As you can see, much work has been done on DEIA at NSF, and we look forward to conducting even more good government DEIA work going forward. I will now turn it back over to Rhonda. Thank you. Thank you, Javier. On the Racial Equity Task Force, we began assembling the team for the Racial Equity Task Force in September of 2020. We have an executive steering committee that includes the president of our union, Local 3403, who has worked closely with us as a partner in these collaborations, resource group members, executive secretaries, and two working groups. The charge is to examine the potential for racial barriers and make recommendations regarding how NSF can be a leader in meaningfully addressing them with the goal of extinguish extinguishing them. I would like to note that race is one com component of the administration's equity blueprint and the work of the task force is a slice of the pie that was led by NSF employees. We are balancing work done with priorities to ensure that we achieve all the metrics set by the administration as it relates to race. We do not want or plan to lose any, anything the employees raised as potential areas of focus. And the Racial Equity Task Force's efforts will continue as a standalone effort that will adapt metrics of the executive orders as applicable, while also being a resource to the overarching equity initiatives. Just a recap reminder, listed here are the areas of focus for employment and program delivery. And at a minimum, their charge was to review these areas and advise uh, that they could look at broader array of areas if needed. Next slide, please. I would like to share an update on the Racial Equity Task Force's work. 
there are three preliminary emerging overarching topical themes that are coming out. One, data collection systems and self-reporting. Two, recruitment. And three, standard, standardization and uniformity across the agency. Once this phase is complete with appropriate subject matter expert collaboration, the next phase will take a deeper dive into looking at potential barriers raised and a long-term entity to engage in racial equity will be established for future phases. All will fall under the administration's equity umbrella. Next slide. Here are a few highlights in regards to our diversity, inclusion, equity, and accessibility accomplishments. In diversity, we conducted numerous trainings and facilita facilitated discussions across the foundation designed to value and respect diverse perspectives. In, in, in inclusion, we established employee resource groups, held special observances and events to create a more inclusive environment. In equity, we conducted barrier analysis, Title IX reviews, complaint processing to remove barriers to equity. And in accessibility, we conducted new procedures and streamlined processes to enhance our accessibility efforts. I'll now turn over to Wansi. Thank you, Rhonda and Javier, for laying out the highlights for all the good work being done across NSF, well ahead of the most recent executive order 14035. It's been nearly one year since we stood up the NSF Racial Equity Task Force. Amidst civil unrest, we rolled up our sleeves and got to work. Many leaders, myself included, and our union partners led difficult conversations with staff across the agency to increase the understanding and perspectives of all during that time. As you've seen or heard in the ODI's briefing, NSF was working on, working on racial equity and diversity initiatives prior to the executive orders. And we will continue to identify and pursue additional opportunities going forward. Because we are a small, agile agency, and because we have established relationships across a federal enterprise, completed previous work within the same government-wide groups, we have a seat at the tables at the most highest level on these and other issues. We're working hand-in-hand -hand with the other agencies and we continue to collaborate with each other to make sure our efforts move forward. We do not view this as a mandate that requires a one-time response. Rather, we can view this as continuing the good work we are, have already been doing. To put it more plainly, we view our efforts not as a project, but as a process to be ingrained in our culture in the DNA of NSF. We are confident our equity assessment and subsequent DEIA strategic plan will help to ensure diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility at NSF, further strengthen the agency's commitment to a fair and equitable workplace for all. I want to thank you, the NSB, for your continued support. We will keep you posted on our progress as our strategic plans and reports are shared with the administration. This concludes our brief and my colleagues and I avail ourselves to your questions. Thank you. Um, yeah, can you hear me? Hello? Can you Yes, yes we are. I, I'm sorry. I, I, I actually unmuted myself a few minutes ago and the host promptly muted me again. And so I was it was unexpected. I, I tell you there's a gremlin in there. Anyway, thank you very much for your presentation. It's been illuminating about all the work you've been doing. And it really has been um, you know, quite a challenge as far as it's an ongoing challenge, but a very worthwhile um, piece of work on everybody. So I really have enjoyed your presentation. That said, we have a very few minutes um, for questions. And do I have any questions from um, the Committee on Oversight or from the board at this point? Oh, either <laughs> you've tired them out or you've... Uh, it looks like Dr. McCurry has a question. Oh, you just, you, you didn't come up. Oh, you haven't got a little thing on my... Okay, please ask your question, Vic. <laughs> Thank you, Nia. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you, Rhonda, Javier, and Wanzi, for an excellent presentation. 
Um, and, and kudos, obviously, to, to Ponch and, and Karen, because it all starts at the top. I want to just say one, and I have a question, but I want to remark, I, I, I am very proud of you all in terms of, first of all, when you change the name, because what that reflects is what a change has been at industry has been going on for a long time, but also reflects something that I'm glad you're embracing as government. And that is, instead of being reactive and looking at from compliance, and I'm not knocking those things, those are very important, but going out to be proactive to talk about changing culture, because we have to change the culture, because as much as we talk about broader participation, if our video doesn't match the audio, then it doesn't mean anything. And that has opened up a lot of eyes, what you all are doing, particularly in the minority serving community. Uh, they are looking at what's happening at NSF. And I can tell you, people are very, very happy and they're applauding your efforts. And I also wanna give a kudos to you, Anelia, because your committee and oversight you, for, for pushing these things in the board and my board colleagues, uh, you're, you may not see it, but I hear it a lot, the changes that they're seeing in NSF you're leading. One question or, or something to consider for you, Rhonda, and you don't have to answer it now, but that you all may want to do is, how do you take this on the road to our customers? And in this case is the universities. While universities are doing a lot of discussions, particularly last year in terms of DEIA, um, we're not seeing the results in terms of faculty. Uh, if we look at the chemistry departments, for example, with the ACS STEM, uh, uh, oxide study that was funded by NSF. You know, those percentages do not represent the percentages in the population. And when we talk about the missing millions, that is one choke point in the pipeline. It's the faculty. So just don't, you don't have to answer it now, but something to consider, or if you have some thoughts, uh, how does NSF get to its customers so that its customers start considering and inculcating the strategies you've done to change the culture at NSF that they can change the culture, particularly at the graduate level in STEM at the research institutions. Yes, thank you for that because it's very timely. Uh, we're just recruiting uh, outreach persons in our office who will be able to work closely across the foundation. And we've heard, uh, even with our harassment term and condition, that individuals need to hear from us at different locations, even as some of our MSIs. So we will be doing some coordinated effort with the rest of the foundation with our new outreach position. And I think it's gonna set us up, it set us up in a really good posture to do just what you just stated. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there any more questions? Oh, Emilio has a question too. Emilio? Yes, it's a question about whether this is possible. If we can identify which fields are profoundly deficient in reaching the goals of diversity and equity and inclusion, is it possible in the review process uh, to basically alert those fields that it be expected that their uh, proposals for research support include a specific strategy for them to address this deficiency in their field. Because what are they gonna do through their research proposals, for example, to address this deficiency? Uh, I don't know if that's possible, but I would like to raise it as a possible way to get at the guilt problem that I raised earlier, that those, they run, they run their fields. It's very hard to affect them unless you directly go to the guild and say your guild is deficient in meeting the goals that NSF and the nation has for diversity and inclusion. And so we wanna see in your broader impact statement, what are you doing about it? That's, that's a very good com uh, uh, comment and a suggestion that we can have a further conversation with OIA when it comes to broader impacts. And we've uh, been working with professional societies on the barrier side of things, but I hear what you're saying being in, on the proactive side. So thanks for that. And we'll take that feedback and uh, discuss it with our colleagues. 
And if I could just add, uh, Emilio, it's a, it's, a, it's a lovely suggestion. It's a wonderful suggestion. And um, size, for instance, has been doing this um, in some of their proposals. So they have been doing a pilot now for the last couple of years um, where they are requiring a, um, uh, a, a statement of how they are going to broaden participation in the research work that they're proposing. So they have been analyzing the changes that have been happening, both within the departments, for the research teams that have been coming in, and they've started to share that across the foundation um, for us to think about um, uh, what we're learning from that and are there aspects of that that we should be fanning out uh, more broadly within the foundation. So um, I, I think that's getting at the, the type of suggestion that, that, you've just, uh, that you've just relayed here. Thank you. That's great. That's good news. Thank you. Well, I oh, and now Jerry has a question. question. I've got one. I'm very yeah. interested in size, uh, what they're doing. Um, are you talking about you're evaluating what they're doing in the broader impact? That's where you're talking about encouraging them to be better about this in the broader impact, Karen. Um, so it's um, so it's actually a, an add-on. So it's not it, it goes beyond broader impact. So they require in some of their programs their researchers. And if Margaret's on, she she would be able to describe more. But yeah, but it's it's actually additional. So it's beyond broader impact. What percentage of the evaluation goes for that? Um, that I would need to check with Margaret and get back to you well, on. It, if we do the holistic approach, uh, it's very ambiguous. And, and but the, but they have been tracking that, Jerry. Um, I don't I don't have the I I don't have the I don't want to misstate, but they have been tracking that in the review process. Margaret, do you want to comment on that? Hi, good afternoon. I'd be happy to. This is our broadening participation in computing pilot, and it engages the full PI community in writing a BPC or broadening participation in computing plan. Um, the plan is required at the time that certain awards are made, uh, 500K and up, and uh, those plans are assessed by a BPC expert, um, and we've been tracking as they move through different stages from getting started to more meaningful stages of impact. Well, that's really great to hear because right now we have no follow-up of broader impacts uh, generally across the uh, foundation. So to see that you're doing the tracking on top of that uh, is a good example of how NSF should go. Well, I have to say that I hate to stop such an energetic discussion. I mean, I, I realize your questions are over, but um, I, I will restrain myself under the circumstances. I had a question, but I, the moment I think I'd like to return. Hi, Hi Neil, this is Phil. I'm sorry to interject in my, my role as executive secretary, but I know we were looking for a few moments for Steve to, to update us on enterprise risk management. I wanted to suggest this would be a good time for that, if Steve's ready. Yes, I am. Actually, I was just about to introduce Steve. Wonderful. <laughs> okay, so sorry about that, Steve. So can you update us um, on um, your talks about enterprise risk management um, with the foundation in two minutes flat? <laughs> yes, ma'am. I, I, uh, thank you. My, the gremlins got to me at my assigned time. Um, I, the, com <laughs> the committee on site is actively engaged with NSF staff to review and maintain the foundation's enterprise risk management, what we call ERM program. ERM is a systemic program to identify and establish remediations for risk and to identify opportunities for the foundation. Of particular importance are risks and opportunities which span more than one division. In other words, we can see things that are not part of the daily purview of an assistant director. There are four key areas for ERM. One, identification of risks and opportunities two, analysis of the issues, three, production of the response to existing risk and to have a plan of action for potential risks, and four, monitoring risks and opportunities. ERM is a classical part of the oversight function and is an integral part of the role of the Committee on Oversight. Last month, last month the NSF staff had a follow-up meeting with me. We went over how NSF's ERM program has been maturing since the agency's last update to the board. The team emphasized that, to date, they have focused on the government-wide ERM targets. I emphasized that the success of staff has been excellent to date and suggested further conversations to develop a unique plan 
that continues their work to focus on NSF specific risks and opportunities. I commended the staff on their success to date. We agreed that framing NSF's enterprise risk is different from the Office of Inspector General's management challenges. ERM is a continuous process, not the point in time. ERM is a vital part of NSF's mission. We agreed that regular communication between the NSF staff and the committee about how NSF is using ERM to address emerging risks is valuable. We look forward to more conversations in the future. That ends my report, Madam Chair. Oh, thank you. I, thank you, Steve. That was very helpful. I think I'd just like to make the board aware that we are making efforts on the Oversight Committee to really keep connected with enterprise risk management because it is such an important part of the foundation as we go into all these different fields and we start all embark on this new, um, what shall I say, attitude of um, uh, more technicalities that we have and more, um, I think that it will be important important to have this link and we will keep you updated. Does anyone have any questions um, for Steve about this conversation at this time? Seeing no questions, I'll say thank you again, Steve. I think we're all pleased to know this is happening. And um, I will move on now, since you mentioned her name, to um, Alison Lerner and Mark Bell's presentation, the Inspector General's update. And we'll follow that with the Chief Financial Officer's update, Teresa Grankovich. And um, if we go. I'm trying desperately to keep to time. So, Alison. Thank you so much, Anila, and it's great to be here with all of you again. Uh, I wanted to start before I turn the floor over to Mark to update you on the matters that are detailed in your board book on some outreach that our office is doing in the research security space. Obviously, when we're talking about ongoing investigations, there's a lot I can't say, but I can definitely share with you the outreach that we've undertaken in this area. And I think that, that you'll be you know, pleased by its depth and breadth. So in April, I did a keynote presentation for Texas A&M's Academic Security and Counter Exploitation Program Seminar. And in that, I was able to explain how our office came to be involved in research security matters, which is through our focus on grant fraud resulting from situations where individuals have failed to disclose their membership in a foreign talent plan while applying for NSF funding. I also shared promising practices we had observed through our investigative activity. And on July 8th, Megan Wallace, the head of our Office of Investigations, and I did a presentation for the National Science, Technology, and Security Roundtable of the National Acad Academies, along with representatives of HHS and Energy OIGs. Our goal was to demystify the role of inspectors general in research security and ensure that participants understood that our community's focus is on grant fraud how we approach our cases, and how we're collaborating with others across government who are responding to these challenges. Finally, last Friday, we hosted another meeting of the Foreign Influence Working Group, which our office has led since 2018. We created this working group to bring our peers and the law enforcement community together to share insights and approaches to responding to the challenge posed by foreign talent programs to, federal research, to the federal research enterprise. The meeting consisted of several ex excellent presentations, including one by a university rep detailing the steps his university system has taken to meet this challenge. Invitations went to 249 people from 37 agencies, including OIGs, the FBI, other law enforcement entities, and U.S. attorney's offices. That is you know, my briefing there. If you've got any questions, I'm happy to take them. Otherwise, I'll turn the floor over to Mark, who'll brief you all on our recently issued COVID capstone report and share some ins insights about how we plan to approach external audits in FY22. So, no questions? The floor is yours, Mark. Thank you, Allison. Mm -hmm. I believe I have some slides coming up. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to present today. I'm going to speak about our results of our COVID-19 award recipient audits and preview our near and long-term award recipient audit approach. 
Our, <clears throat> our COVID-19 audits at the outset of the pandemic Office of Management and Budget, budget authorized and NSF implemented temporary administrative flexibilities that relax standard grant management and requirements and help the award recipient community better respond to health, safety, and operational challenges it was facing. These flexibilities include allowance for costs that aren't typically allowable and continuation of salary payments to individuals who are unable to perform work due to COVID-19 shutdown, related shutdowns. Given the unique and extraordinary nature of these flexibilities, we contracted with an accounting firm to conduct 10 audits of award recipient institutions to examine how the flexibilities were implemented. To select, um, next slide, please. To select the auditees, we used a risk assessment that identified the institutions that were most likely to have utilized the flexibilities, and we ensured that we selected a range of institutions of various sizes, locations, and funding. We issued the last of the 10 reports this past Monday. We're happy to report this is a good news story for NSF. NSF quickly issued guidance and implementing instructions for these flexibilities and was lauded by several, several recipients for the quick implementation uh, of these flexibilities. However, not all agencies were as successful in their efforts. And this too appears to have caused confusion and impacted implementation at some institutions. Next slide, please, please. <clears throat> so why write this report? These tabs provided a snapshot of the successes and challenges related to the flexibilities and provided insights into how these flexibilities could be enhanced and built upon in a future emergency. We, we contracted with the same accounting firm that conducted the audits to write a capstone report communicating common themes, findings, lessons learned, and issues related to the flexibilities. The goal of this report was to create a body of work that federal government can use to inform future decisions in the event of another national emergency that warrants the use of these flexibilities or others. The, the capstone report was issued yesterday. Next slide, please. So some common observations, and first to reemphasize, NSF was both quick and thorough in issuing its guidance. This uh, discussion in our report relates to the broader grant community. Um, first and foremost, we found that NSF award recipients we audited used the flexibilities to continue performing essential research during the pandemic and were generally prudent in their stewardship for federal resources. For example, recipients use the flexibilities to continue employing <clears throat> and paying salaries to individuals who are unable to perform work due to COVID-19 related shutdowns and to purchase things such as air purifying systems, sanitizing material, and other PPE to help ensure the health and safety of employees who could perform sponsored research. Although the audited recipients generally complied with relevant guidance and developed some effective practices for monitoring their compliance, we identified three common themes um, affecting whether and how the recipients use the facility uh, the flexibilities. First, um, in some cases, <clears throat> excuse me, recipients were not able to implement the flexibility. The manner and timing with which agencies implement the flexibility was not uniform across the federal government. Lack of consistent and sometimes untimely guidance was a barrier to recipients choosing to utilize the flexibilities. This impacted award recipient ability to implement the flexibilities, and many grantees were also constrained by staffing resources available, as well as the time frame that the flexibilities were authorized. Given these restraints, some recipients were, un were unable to implement the flexibilities or just simply chose not to. Second, recipients were hesitant to use flexibilities. Because OMB's COVID-19 flexibility memorandum authorized federal awarding agencies to implement the flexibilities themselves, Award recipients were hesitant to take on risk associated with reviewing and tracking compliance with inconsistent guidance issued by multiple federal agencies. Recipients were also concerned that they would not have sufficient funding to achieve the research objective if after the, flexibility, if after the flexibilities, additional funds were not made available, allowing personnel to use personal, federal funds to cover costs not normally chargeable to awards could result in a shortage of funds available to carry out the research activities necessary to accomplish the ultimate objectives of the award. Third, recipients did not consistently track or monitor the use of the flexibilities. Although each audit recipient stated that it implemented one or more of the flexibilities, many recipients were unable to verify whether the flexibilities were actually used as they were required, uh, as they were not required to establish policies for implementation or monitor the use of the flexibilities. Some institutions simply informed personnel that the flexibilities existed. We found that only those recipients that developed formal memoranda and policies outlining how to implement the flexibilities were able to verify whether the flexibilities were used and, and support that the flexibility usage was appropriately monitored. Uh, next slide, please. Um, what, next slide after that, please. Thank you. 
Oops, excuse me. Um, so the conclusions. We identified three conclusions for consideration in the event of another national emergency that warrants the use of this type of flexibility. These conclusions, these conclusions apply to the universe of grant funds, not just for NSF um, funding. First, recipients might have been less hesitant to use flexibilities if they had access to more comprehensive guidance. More precise and comprehensive guidance would reduce the risk of inconsistent implementation and would help encourage risk averse recipients to use the flexibilities. Second, recipients may have been able to use the flexibilities more effectively if they had been able to implement the flexibilities in a more timely and consistent manner. Establishment and harmonization of federal guidance and policies related to potential administrative flexibilities prior to the occurrence of another emergency would help alleviate the need to establish policies on the fly and would decrease recipient effort to implement them. Finally, recipients could have had more effectively monitored federal spending during the pandemic if federal agencies had requirement, required recipients to formally track and use implemented flexibilities as well as flexibility related spending. I'm just gonna pause for a second because the next topic is, has to do with our audit plan and see if there are any questions under uh, on the first part of the presentation. Okay. Uh, Mark, yes, Steve, sir. Steve um, I just wanted to say that what you identified there is very related. It's classic enterprise risk management. When you go to the fact that we not only look and see what happened with regard to COVID, but we begin to think about the importance of preparing for similar things in the future. That, that was a very helpful comment, I thought. Uh, thank you. Um, and, and it does. Uh, inter enterprise risk management, um, really is powerful and um, the agency has one of the best programs I've seen in the three agencies I've been with. Um, and uh, as you said, it's, it's a continuous cycle of improvement and um, hopefully some of our work sort of points that direction too. It does, thank you. Thank you. Um, next, I wanted to talk just a little bit about our audit plan. Steve, uh, excuse me, Steve. Can I, can, can I just ask if you could, um, uh, sorry, Mark, not Steve. Mark, could I just ask if you could hurry up a little bit because um, we, we are have, the time is marching on. Okay, just uh, quickly, um, our audit plan um, for the coming year for recipients. We also have a separate audit plan for our internal work. Uh, we've made some changes to our contract. It's currently under review. It's going to broaden our ability to perform audits, not just at recipients, but also to perform some audits within NSF if we um, don't have the specific skill set or the staff available. Um, the, in, the, in addition to expanding our oversight capabilities, the contract will also help us immediately respond to any pending legislation that comes from the to fruition, such as the Endless Frontiers Act, both to expand our capability to help the agency with oversight. Um, in the near term, we are continuing to um, do the audits and the method that we designed last year, where we survey a, a recipient and in turn um, focus our audit work on where we see specific issues that re with that recipient. Um, one of the key things I want to get, and I'll close with this, Anila, is we our work. As with this COVID report that we did, we are trying to identify promising practices, um, strengths, and other areas that could help recipients improve their oversight. Um, and we're hoping to issue more reports like this one that point to the larger problem and would help other recipients look at um, more, more, more be able to understand what the requirements and what things they should be looking for. And just one last note, um, we're going to, um, we're gonna be conducting um, 10 audits of smaller recipients because that is the area where we find a lot of issues. Um, five will be audits of, higher, of institutions of higher education. Five will be not-for-profit um, organizations. Um, we're hoping that work also results in a, in a capstone. We think it's really important to start going into those areas as we um, seek to, to bring the missing millions into the, into the fold. They're going to need a lot of help and a lot of oversight to make sure that they can, can handle award funds the right way on um, being new grantees. And I will close with that. Oh, thank you, Mark. And your recommendations will not fall on are not falling on deaf ears. I can say regard to the audits of the small and the help for the small and mid-sized institutions. So thank you very much. And are there any other questions for Mark or for Allison? 
Not seeing any, um, I'm going to thank you again for an excellent report. And um, no doubt we will talk to you at our next meeting and hear more about this. Thank you so much, Alison and Mark. Okay. Thank you. And now I'm going to move on to our next and indeed the last uh, speaker of our meeting, who is going to be, all, as always, NSF's Chief Financial Officer, Teresa Grankovic. And so Teresa is going to update all of us on the major efforts in the financial area. But of course, we already have her CFO update in the board book. So I'm going to give you the floor, um, Teresa, and just Keep us completely updated. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Good afternoon. Thank you, Anila, for the introduction and Steve for a recap of our ERM discussion. I want to express my appreciation of the OIG for recognizing NSF efforts in its COVID-19 capstone report. A big thank you to my BFA and NSF colleagues for stepping up to provide amazing support to our community during this profoundly difficult time when they too have been dealing with their own challenges and hardships. Yeah. As mentioned, my written CFO update of July 8th is in the board book, and I'll just provide a few quick updates to that report. First, as Director Panchanathan mentioned yesterday, the American Rescue Plan funding is actively being processed. And as close of business of yesterday, August um, 3rd, 100 million has been awarded on 314 actions with another 60, with another 96 million in the queue to be awarded. Second, the executive order on ensuring the future is made in all of America by all of America's workers was announced on January 25th, 2021. The executive order requires that all agencies use terms and conditions of awards to maximize the use of goods, products and materials produced in the United States. NSF submitted its required report to OMB's Made in America director on July 22nd, prior to the due date. The report outlined that NSF is in compliance with Made in America requirements and provided recommendations to ensure NSF compliance with the policy set forth in section one of the executive order. Finally, in March and April, of 2021, the General Services Administration surveyed federal employees at CFO Act agencies to ask for their satisfaction with mission support services during the past year. The responses provided a detailed picture of customer satisfaction across the surveyed areas for contracting, financial management, human capital, and IT functions. This year, as in the past, NSF has received high rankings for the surveyed services in the Office of Budget Finance and Award Management and the Office of Information and Resource Management. In fact, NSF has ranked first in all the mission support areas. Wanzi and I are very proud of our colleagues in BFA and IRM for continually providing outstanding customer support, especially during this very demanding year. Thank you, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. It's a very um, inspiring uh, number of activities that are being done, and they really seem to have been deserving of praise in a big way. So I'm glad they're getting the praise. Um, I'd like to ask any questions for um, Teresa. I'm not seeing anyone. Okay, so I'm going to thank you again for a succinct and completely um, a more than adequate presentation, and it was good to hear from you, and we'll hear from you next time. So with that, I think it's the end of this afternoon's session. I'd like to thank everyone um, who presented this afternoon and let us know what was going on in all these other areas of the um, of the foundation. And um, also, um, I think that um, we're almost... Heart, we're just a little bit over time, but I think that um, Madam Chair will forgive me and I'm passing the gavel over to you now, um, Ellen. Thank you very much, Anil. And actually, we're right on time. So we'll take a 10 minute break and reconvene at 5.05 .05 p.m. Eastern for a plenary open session. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, oh, come on.
And Phil, if you'll pass the host back, I'll start recording. Madam Chair, we're streaming live and recording. Thank you. The plenary open session of the 473rd meeting of the National Science Board is reconvening. I welcome foundation staff, guests, and members of the public. Before we get into the agenda, I have a couple of announcements and acknowledgements to make. First, I'd like to announce that we've established the planning group for our NSB retreat on October 19th and 20th. Steve Willard has agreed to lead the, lead the group along with Suresh Babu, Dario Gill, and Julia Phillips. The retreat will be an opportunity for conversation on how the board might evolve its meetings and approach to govern an agency with an expanded mission and growing budget. I remain hopeful that we'll be able to meet in person at NFS, NSF headquarters, but of course that's subject to where things stand with the COVID-19 variants and the agency's plans for reopening the building. So uh, to reiterate, I'd ask that members not make airplane reservations until you get the green light from NSBO staff. However, please keep your calendar available for travel time uh, until such time as we update you. I'm sure Steve would welcome any thoughts that you have or any of the other members on the retreat team. So please don't hesitate to reach out to him or them or to Elise Lipkowitz, who is the lead staff. Earlier today in the executive session, the Committee on Nominations completed its work in delivering a slate of candidates for the board class of 2022 to 2028. These names will be submitted to the White House for its consideration when it makes appointments for the new class to be seated next May. I'd like to publicly thank Committee Chair Alan Stern and the other committee members, Aaron Dominguez, Dario Gill, Dan Reed, and Jerry Richmond for their diligent and thoughtful deliberations in creating a select list from the 71 nominees. I also want to thank NSBO's Faith Hickson for supporting the committee's work. On behalf of NSB, I'd like to formally welcome Karen Marangel as NSF's new Chief Operating Officer. Karen, we've gotten to know you during your tenure as AD for EHR, and we're excited to work even more closely with you in your new role. And the board would also like to officially welcome Alex Isern, the new AD for Geosciences, and Susan Margulies, the new AD for Engineering. This meeting also marks some transitions. On behalf of the NSBO, I'd like to extend our warm thanks to Susie Iacono and Jim Olvestad, both of whom will be retiring before our next meeting in December, and both of whom have interacted closely informatively and effectively with the board. We also have a staff change in the board office. Keisha Slater-Williams has recently taken a new role in the Human Resources Management Division. Keisha came to the NSBO in 2004, and at the time of her departure, she was the longest tenured NSBO staff member. She'd supported seven NSB chairs, seven NSF directors, and more than 80 NSB members. And among her many tasks, she helped plan and implement close to 100 board meetings and retreats and countless teleconferences. So Keisha, thank you so much for all you've done for us. And we're glad that your talents will continue to be used at NSF. The next item on our agenda is approval of prior minutes from the May plenary session. And these are available in your diligent board book. Are there any corrections to these minutes? Hearing none, the July minutes for the plenary stand approved as presented. I would now like to give the floor to Ponch for his remarks. Thank you, Ellen. And um, it's truly a delight. And uh, I want to walk through some of the uh, staff updates, uh, which is always a very pleasurable thing. The spring and summer have been a busy time for us as we welcome on board our newly appointed senior executives. The individuals I'm going to introduce are critical, critical folks in the leadership team at NSF, joining the existing unbelievable talent that we have at NSF, and their expertise will be very important in carrying out the strategic vision for the agency. 
So I'm glad you recognized our COO. It's my pleasure to announce Dr. Karen Maranjal has joined us as an NSF's next Chief Operating Officer, effective August 1, 2021. Dr. Maranjal has served as NSF Assistant Director for the Education and Human Resources Directorate since 2018. Dr. Maranjal has a distinguished record of accomplishments in research and education. She has been on the faculty at Portland State University since 2001, where she was a professor of mathematics and statistics. She served at Portland State as Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences from 2014 to 2018. Prior to becoming Dean, Dr. Maranjal held positions as the Vice Chancellor for Academic Strategies and Assistant Vice Chancellor for Academic Standards and Collaboration. Dr. Maranjal holds a doctorate in mathematics education from the University of New Hampshire. Please join me in welcoming Karen to a new role as NSF COO. Karen, if you will wave, please, so that people can know you. They know you already, but I just want to make sure that they will never forget your face. <laughs> so thank you so much, Karen, for taking on this role. We are so thrilled. As Karen assumes her new role, Dr. Sylvia Butterfield, is with Sylvia James, will be serving as the Acting Assistant Director for EHR as we commence a national search for an Assistant Director. Sylvia, we are so grateful to you for serving up and doing an amazing job as dad and now as interim AD. Thank you so much for your service to NSF. Dr. Alexandra Isern began serving as her SES career senior executive service appointment as assistant director of the Directorate for Geosciences on July 18, 2021. Dr. Isern, who is known to many of you already, previously served as a deputy assistant director, Directorate of Geosciences. Dr. Isan joined NSF in 2001 as a program director. She has received her PhD from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. It's truly a pleasure to have Alex serve as part of the executive leadership team and lead, lead geosciences in this very important time into the future. I'm thrilled to have Alex Isan as our new AD of geosciences, Alex. Thank you very much, Alex. The next leader that we have, we are thrilled to have joined is Dr. Susan Margulies, who will begin serving as an IPA appointment as Assistant Director AD of Directorate of Engineering, effective August 16, 2021. Dr. Margulies come, comes to the foundation from our positions as Wallace H. Coulter Chair and Professor of Coulter Department of Biomedical Engineering at the Georgia Institute of Technology and Emory University as a Georgia Research Alliance eminent scholar in injury biomechanics. Previously, she was a professor of bioengineering at the University of Pennsylvania School of Engineering and Applied Science. Dr. Margulies earned her BSc in Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at Princeton University and her MSc and PhD in Bioengineering at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Margulies is a very, very accomplished scholar. We are so thrilled to have her and her experience uh, in joining as AD of uh, Engineering and she's gonna do amazing things, I'm confident. So thank you so much, Dr. Margulies, for agreeing to serve NSF and therefore the nation. Welcome on board. Next, Dr. Linnea Avalon will begin serving as NSF's next Chief Officer for Research Facilities. We call it endearingly CORF, effective October 11, 2021. Dr. Avalon will succeed Dr. Jane S. Ulvestad, who will step down as CORF in early October. Let's just mention how James is a phenomenal, phenomenal person and has contributed so much. So Dr. Avalon is an atmospheric chemist who has been at NSF for nine years in the Directorate for Geosciences in a variety of leadership roles, including as an executive secretary for the Natural Science Board Committee on Awards and Facilities. So you all know Linnea already. So prior to coming to NSF, Dr. Avalon was a professor at the University of Colorado Boulder for 17 years with a joint appointment in the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences and the Laboratory for Atmospheric and space physics. I see Carl getting very happy about that. Dr. Avalon holds a bachelor's degree in life sciences from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, as well as master's and PhD degrees in chemistry from Harvard University. Please join me in welcoming Linnea Avalon to her upcoming role at NSF SCORF. Linnea is an amazing talent, so, so fortunate to have her taking on this very, very important role at this very important time for NSF in terms of facilities, she's going to be advanced into the future. Carl, I think you're going to say something. You unmuted yourself. Go ahead. Yes, Stephen, I know exactly what I'm saying. 
it's really great to have you in this position. We look forward, well, I, I look forward to at least another six or eight months time with you before I turn into a pumpkin. But I guarantee you, your colleagues in Boulder look forward to continued interaction. And by the way, you picked a good time to be in Washington. It's hot and ozone action days here. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Really appreciate your comments there. Uh, the next person that we have as an outstanding leader joining our leadership team is Ms. Ona Haas. Began serving as the SES Career Senior Executive Service Appointment as Deputy General Counsel, Office of the General Counsel on June 6, 2021. Mr. Haas previously served as Assistant Legal Advisor, Office of Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs at the Department of State where she served for 16 years. Ms. Haas has been a member of SES since 2019. She received her JD magna cum laude from the University of Michigan Law School. I tell you, it's a privilege and an honor to have Ms. Haas join us in the Office of Legal Counsel working with Peggy Hoyle as our general counsel. I think this is a fantastic team. And so thank you so much, Ms. Haas, for joining us at NSF and, and thinking of this as a much better place than anywhere else that you have been. Thank you so much. Um, the next leader, that uh, I want to introduce to you all is Dr. Roslyn Hargraves. She began serving an IP assignment as Division Director, Division of Undergraduate Education, Director of Education and Human Resources on August 2nd, 2021. She's currently Associate Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Virginia Commonwealth University. As an educator, researcher, and leader in higher education, Dr. Hargraves has demonstrated a commitment to a student's education, profession, and diversity and inclusion. Dr. Hargraves earned her PhD in electrical engineering from the University of Virginia. Thank you, Rosalind, for joining us. It's truly a pleasure and a delight to have you join us. I know you're going to make a huge impact in our agency in terms of how we are going to promote even more robust diversity, inclusion, and most importantly, student outcomes and achievement. Thank you so much. Welcome on board. The next leader, Dr. Roberta Marinelli, began serving her IP assignment as director Office of Polar Programs, as we fondly call OPP, Directorate for Geosciences on, on August 2nd, 2021. She's currently the Dean of the College of Earth, Ocean, and Atmospheric Sciences at Oregon State University, OSU, the Executive Dean for the Earth System Science Division at OSU, and the Associate Director for NOVA's Cooperative Institute for Climate, Ocean, and Ecosystem Studies. She was previously Executive Director of the Wrigley Institute for Environmental Studies, at the University of Southern California from 2011 to 2016. Dr. Marinelli received her PhD from the Marine Science Program at the University of South Carolina. Roberta, welcome on board, and it's truly a delight to have you lead the OPP. And I tell you, when I was talking to some folks outside the agency and sharing that you're going to join us as OPP lead, they were just simply thrilled to know that you have accepted to do that. But thank you so much for your service. Next leader, Dr. Jose Zayas, Castro began serving his IP assignment as Division Director, Engineering Education and Centers, the Directorate for Engineering on August 2nd, 2021. He joins us from the University of South Florida, where he was the Executive Associate Dean and Associate Dean for International Affairs at the College of Engineering. He was a founding partner of the Vector Corporation, a design and innovation engineering firm in Mayagos, Puerto Rico. He has established and led new partnerships with academic stakeholders throughout his career, collaborated with industry and nonprofit foundations, provided leadership in professional association, and engaged international universities to enhance faculty-driven research and student learning. Dr. Zayas Castro received his PhD in management from Rensselaer Polytechnic University. I'm so thrilled to have you, Jose, join us, and particularly your, your, your varied experiences across many different sectors that you have worked in is going to be tremendously beneficial and particularly your experiences in Puerto Rico. The other day I was saying to people that we should just dive in and get your expertise captured fully to see how we can serve the region of Puerto Rico even better from NSF. So thank you so much and welcome on board. Dr. Jean Van Brissen will begin serving her IP assignment as Division Director, Division of Chemical, Bioengineering, Environmental and Transport Systems in the Directorate of Engineering on August 16, 2021. Dr. Van Brissen, Vice Provost for Faculty is the Duchenne Light Company Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering and Engineering and Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon University and the Director of the Center for Water Quality 
in Urban Environmental Systems, Water Quest at Carnegie Mellon University. Dr. Van Driesen's broad research interests are in natural and engineered water systems. Dr. Van Driesen received a PhD in Civil Environmental Engineering from Northwestern University. Jean, we are thrilled to have you join us. It's, it's truly a pleasure. And I, I know that this division is going to reach much, much greater heights with your tremendous leadership. Welcome on board and thank you for, for your service to NSF and the nation. Next up, Mr. Victor Powers began service, ser serving his SES career senior executive service appointment as deputy division director, division of administrative services, DAS, in the Office of Information and Resource Management, OIRM, on June 2nd, 2021. Mr. Powers was previously the director of the Office of Management and Business Operations at the US Department of Commerce, International Trade Administration. Mr. Powers brings to NSF substantial experience in leading and management, manage, managing a variety of administrative programs, such as acquisitions, interagency agreements, property assets, program evaluation, space and facilities management, physical and personal security, continuity of operations, emergency preparedness, safety and health, freedom of information, records management, and travel management. Mr. Powers has a master's degree in business management, human resource development from Webster University. Victor, thank you so much for joining us. I've already heard amazing things about you and we look forward to working with you and I'm, I'm sure you're gonna make this agency much, much more enriched uh, with your service in OIRM and across the agency. Thank you so much and welcome on board. Thank you. Dr. Jun, Junping Wang began serving as a deputy division director, triple D as we call them, for the Division of Mathematical Sciences, DMS, on August 1st, 2021. Dr. Wang has served as a program director for 18 years, specializing in the development of growth of key partnerships. Prior to joining NSF, Dr. Wang received, as a, served as a professor and the acting head in the Department of Mathematical and Computer Sciences at Colorado School of Mines, and as a professor in the Department of Mathematics and the director of the Institute of Scientific Commun Computing at the University of Wyoming. Dr. Wang received his PhD in mathematics from the University of Chicago. Jinping, thank you so much for your service to NSF already. And then now taking on this very, very important role at this very important time. So we really appreciate your service to NSF and welcome on board. And last but not the least, Dr. Lin Hay, being appointed as Deputy Division Director, Triple D, for the Division of Chemistry on July 4th, 2021. Dr. Hay was previously an IPA Program Director then returned to us in 2014. She's a strong advocate for data-driven discovery research and her relentless efforts in promoting data science and chemistry were recognized in the, 20, with the 2018 NSF Director's Award for Superior Accomplishment. Prior to joining NSF, Dr. He was a tenured faculty member in the Department of Chemistry at North Carolina State University. Her research interests lie at the interface of bioanalytical chemistry and nanotechnology. Dr. He received her PhD in chemistry from Pennsylvania State University. Len, Truly a delight to have you take on this role. You've been a tremendous asset to NSF and have done amazing work as your awards truly demonstrate. We are thrilled to have your, a person of your caliber taking on leadership role and serving at this important time. I'm personally excited that you're taking on this role. So look forward to working with you all. This, Madam Chair, you will see is an unbelievable uh, leadership team, unbelievable leaders that you've been fortunate enough to attract to NSF or retain at NSF in a different role. And that demonstrates what a vibrant agency NSF is and why people feel compelled to serve. And most importantly, with the mindset of service to the nation and NSF and the scientific community, we truly are grateful to every one of them and look forward to working with each one of them. So thank you, Madam Chair. And I will just give a brief OLPA report. Um, in your board book, uh, Amanda Greenwald, our leader of office head of the Office of Legislative and Public Affairs has provided you with an information item on legislative and public affairs activities since the May board meeting. As always, OLPA has kept us very connected to the administration, Hill, our scientific community, and the public. I noted some of these in my remarks yesterday. Does anyone have any questions about the OLPA report? If not, Madam Chair, Thank you so much for the opportunity. I know it was a, a little bit of a longer one, but I want you all to celebrate because I said, I want to introduce my leadership team, the triple Ds, DDs, uh, you know, dads and ADs, all of them, because this is NSF. This is the NSF leadership team. And this is what NSF is all about and how it flows down all the way to NSF. I know I am very, very proud. I know my leadership my team is proud 
And I can already see the pride in some of your faces already, if not all. So thank you so much and over to you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Ponch. And I certainly should have given a board welcome to Linnea Avalon as well, um, given her close interaction in that position with the board. But we're very happy to be introduced to all the other new leaders uh, that you just mentioned, Ponch. So thank you. I'd now like to turn to Jerry Richmond, Chair of the Committee on External Engagement to report on the committee's meeting last Friday. Great. Well, I um, am pleased to be able to report to you, Madam Chairman, and I want to give you a big thanks and Ponch and the rest of the leadership team for giving us the prime spot for our community college uh, panel uh, yesterday morning. It was just really, uh, really super uh, to have it with such visibility. Okay, so I'd like to start with a reminder that the nominations for the National Sciences Board 2022 been, uh, Beniever Bush and Public Service Awards opened in July and will close on September 13th. That's not very far away. Uh, thanks so much to Maureen Kondik and the other committee members nominating someone for these awards has never been easier with new online forms on our websites. So go check it out. Staff are implementing additional committee suggestions to spur nominations from across the country, and we hope that all of you are encouraging your networks to submit nominations. Now, turning to the report out, the External Engagement Committee met July 30th, discussed the virtual roundtable NSB held on June 15th with 20 state government, business, education, and academic leaders in Tennessee, hosted by Suresh Babu. Thank you, Suresh. A summary of the roundtable, which focused on developing STEM talent for the workforce that Tennessee and the country need, is in your board book and on the NSB website. We, look, we will look to this virtual roundtable approach for future events, such as those being planned with the University of Texas for academic leaders across the state of Texas. We also discussed initial engagement on the first of the 2022 Science and Engineering Indicators Report on Elementary and Secondary STEM Education, uh, which was released in July. We shared the report with members of the media, congressional staff, OSTP, and with the professional societies with higher education and higher education groups. And now in our news release, we underscored key NSB takeaways, including the imperative to address poor US student performance in math and the need for a STEM capable workforce. And as you heard yesterday, thanks to Julia, Marine, and other members of the SEP committee, we have a new one pager on K through 12 data on areas of national concern that we will hope will be a resource for Congress and others who need and can act on this information. And you heard yesterday that Julia Phillips will continue contribute a piece about the report to NSF's blog Science Matters and that we anticipate meetings in fall with Congress and other key groups to discuss the report and its implications. Okay, now I'd like to turn to two items that EE would like to discuss with the board. The first is our draft S&E indicators plan, which is in your board book. It reflects many of the activities of the board has done in the past and suggests additional groups which we might wish to engage with. The engagement activities we've done in the past are a mixture of broad dissemination via the media and social media and targeted briefings and meetings with specific entities and organizations. Now, the rolling release of 2022 indicators reports, which have already started and will continue into the spring of next year, give us multiple opportunities to get the word out, uh, bring attention to and engage on data and trends that are relevant to advancing boards, the board's vision 2030 goals. So with that, uh, this usually is a lively discussion and we hope that that's the case here. I'd like to open it up for discussion. Uh, to, about what are the kinds of things that we can advance with regards to PR and information to get out there. Now, as a reminder, uh, NSB and our staff partner with NCSES and with OPA on many of these uh, activities. And uh, in your board book, there's also some, uh, there's a, a page on uh, things to uh, be thinking about with what things to consider once we uh, do start doing some of these rollouts. So uh, what do you have in mind? Any of you board members have in mind with regards to what you think our priorities should be in these rollouts? What, where should we focus our efforts? Uh, and is there anything or anyone missing that we'd like to, uh, to catch up on? And I realize that 
uh, this is kind of as a prelude before a lot of these things will be coming out, but we'd really like to be able to have some idea of where the board is thinking about what are key issues that we should highlight with this uh, data that will be coming out. So I'm gonna leave that open to uh, see if anyone wants to join in and give us ideas. I'll have Nadine help me if, if anyone raises their hands that I can't see while I've got five different things on my screen. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not seeing any hands right now, Jerry. Come on, guys. Come on, <laughs> come up with something, you know. What's some hot oh, wait. Ellen, Ellen has her hand up. Ellen and Julia. All right, all right, good, good. Okay, Ellen. I'm not sure. I don't think this is really maybe in the realm of new ideas, but just a couple of comments I was going to make. Um, you know, one of the things Artie keeps bringing up is also looking at socioeconomic issues as it comes to, um, you know, inclusivity. And so I wanted to make sure that as to note that um, the one pager on K through 12 does have, you know, one of its three main points is looking at um, students um, who are eligible for free lunch and those that are not as a way of getting at that data and the differences between. So I think just continuing to see when that data is available, um, making that part of, of what we do, um, I think would help respond to, to that issue, which um, we, maybe we haven't focused on as much before. And then the only other thing I was gonna mention is, you know, normally um, when we kind of do the big rollout in January of even numbered years, um, the, the, the chair and, um, and then often the, the along with the chair of the SEP committee, um, do in-person visits um, with members of Congress and heads of committees. You know, it's not completely clear to me how much in-person visiting we'll be doing in January of next year, but, um, you know, any of the products that we develop, for example, the um, policy product that Julia talked about yesterday that would accompany this, um, you know, making sure it's available on the website and in a way where you can, you know, maybe use it to click to other things. It will be uh, much easier than for us to be able to do, I think, effective virtual um, presentations where, you know, in some cases, it, it may be even a little bit more effective because we can actually maybe go to, um, you know, a picture or, or a graph or something to um, actually bring it up and, and talk about it. But um, we just have to be thinking about the format in which we'll be able to roll it out. Yeah, those are good points, Ellen, especially because we're so much more used to doing virtual and getting a bigger audience geographically, certainly, um, with uh, the way we do things virtually. And But Julia, you are the queen of this. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to you to give us your comments. Well, I know I think I think Ellen makes some really good points. And one of the, um, I mean, ideally, even if we can do a lot of briefings in person, I think there is value in also um, expanding the virtual reach to specific groups and um, trying to do a better job of getting geographic reach, which is one of our uh, areas of emphasis at this point. And so, so I think thinking a little differently than what we've historically thought about in terms of that kind of dissemination is important. The other thing which I mentioned yesterday uh, in the SEP committee is um, really looking hard at what messages come about from looking across thematic reports because I mean, it's really great that they've been disaggregated and it gives you, a, there are a lot of really good things that have come from that. I'd never go back, but you have to work a little harder to get the cross-cutting themes where you have to pull pieces from different, different thematic reports. Just as one example, it is um, things about the workforce required to support emerging industries. And, um, in many cases at this point, the great dependence on and the value that we place on foreign born um, degree recipients in the fields that are going to be important in those emerging industries is something that kind of comes from, if you look at, the, at different parts of the thematic reports, you can pull it out, but it's not so obvious if you are just looking at any one of them. Um, and the other thing I really don't want to have lost is 
that yes, we are really hitting the need for domestic talent and the missing millions, and that's absolutely correct. But we also want to continue to welcome, attract, and retain the best and brightest from around the world. And uh, you'll see in the data that there's been you know, a real drop off as a result of COVID and maybe some other things. And um, whether that comes back um, and how fast, um, maybe a harbinger of things to come. And so thinking about, you know, delivering the message that those people are really important too. And, you know, there's some of some data that we're trying to pull together that, that says they contribute in perhaps a somewhat different way. Again, diversity and in a different axis. Um, and so I, I would uh, hate to see those messages lost. Thanks, Julia. Suresh. Thank yeah, you thank you. Um, in fact, uh, so Julia said some of what I wanted to say, but I'll just put a slightly different take on it too. Um, you know, at one point we used to talk about science diplomacy a lot uh, in Washington, D.C. and elsewhere. I don't hear that so much anymore. Um, and I think this international engagement whether it be for research collaborations, researcher exchange, mobility, virtual networks, the, the lay of the land has changed a lot, but I think that um, it's even more important now that we start thinking about good ways of um, getting back on that horse, uh, trying to figure out good ways of engaging, good meaning, effective ways of engaging. Um, as, as Julia said, uh, SCP has put out some or is putting out um, data and, and position papers and such on uh, the role of immigrants and the role of immigration. Uh, COVID obviously slowed a lot of this, but so did a few other policy issues. I think um, we're coming out of some of that, but it has gotten more challenging. You probably saw a nice article, uh, I think it was today or yesterday, about when uh, Will will the US remain a beacon um, for, for, for other researchers? So I don't think we will be uh, unless we put a lot more effort into it. So I look forward to OISC's work as it gears up, but it goes beyond that. It goes, I think the NSB has a role, all directorates have a role. So we probably need to rethink and refocus on that. Thank you. Great, thanks, Suresh. Uh, Roger, just give, give us a quick one. That would be perfect. Uh, yeah, well, just, just to say that, that with that uh, education and talent and talent development focus, at the same time on uh, with our um, sort of resolve to establish AI institutes uh, nationwide and, and the REIs, another thing in uh, that, that matrix between the need for talent development and the desire to, to, to be to be more geographically uh, dispersed uh, raises a challenge. And I wonder if, if there's a way that the, that the director and others can bring focus, bring awareness that those will be placed where there's talent. Uh, it's not just where talent is now, uh, but wh where, we, where it should be. And, and that that's may give us some problems actually as we try to choose those regions. And maybe there's a way we can emphasize um, the importance of talent development in that context. Just a comment. Great, thanks. Uh, Stephen, do you have something really quick because we've got to move on? Sure, I think Julia is right, but also I noticed bipartisan support for national security issues in connection with the money we're getting. And so I think we're threading the needle um, and maintaining uh, interest in the national security issues as well. Yep, yep, good point, good point. And I think as uh, the climate is right now with regards to certainly the China, uh, anything that's put out with regards to what our uh, statistics are on funding and so forth is China, but not as if we're looking over our shoulder, but that's why that's the reason that we're going forward uh, at NSF with these initiatives that are really pumping up innovation so that we're racing ahead rather than to keep looking over our shoulder. Well, thank you very much uh, for this. Uh, if you have any more ideas, please let uh, Nadine know. She's our contact person. Okay, so I have one uh, second uh, discussion item. This is kind of fun, uh, so think fun. Uh, now, this is a very active board with high aspirations, particularly around advancing Vision 2030 goals, and engagement is a huge part of that. So uh, since we can't uh, do it all, we have to start to set some priorities on what kind of things we want to engage the public 
uh, with, and we need a method to do that. So uh, the, the, the team and I came up with a little bit of a prototype of a tool uh, that in case you don't play on your computer enough um, to allow us to help us through that. So I'd like to put up some slides to show this prototype. Uh, so could we please have the first slide? And again, this is to help us, you know, think, help you, me, we all think about what we'd like to uh, have uh, EE take on. So if I could have the first slide, that would be great. Is it coming? Bruce, are you there and able to show the slides? Um, you know what? If he's not there, let me see if I can uh, share okay. my screen. All right. All right. Oh, oh, there we go. Yes. Okay, yeah. great. Okay. Cool. Good. Okay. So um, this isn't a game. This is important, but it's got kind of a game look to it. So here you see four boxes, and it really represents the, the questions we need for any engagement activity. So you've got this idea, you think it's kind of cool, we should be going out there about it. And so we have four different categories to, that you can uh, think about with your idea. And uh, what, for example, as you see here, what is the issue? Uh, what is our goal? Uh, and why, uh, why is really, what is the goal? Who, who are we trying to reach? And how are we gonna do that? Now, when you think of an idea, um, it may be the, the what. I've got a big issue here and that's really great. Or it may be that I think we need to do more engagement in this particular way because this could bring in younger people or whatever it is. So you're thinking more about the way. Whichever way you enter into the any of these boxes, whatever field you choose, then thinking through these four different boxes uh, and we would then allow this online, you'd be able to go to one of these boxes and fill in what you're thinking is on all for these, so it could give us some idea of what you're thinking. So the what, you'd see some examples such as when you click on what, uh, <laughs> Stephen, well, it does look like a domino pizza. Yes, yes, okay, okay, all right. Um, uh, you see example, you would, if you click on what, you would see some examples at, under what, uh, such as our in science engineering indicators that you could click on to say, and see if your category is there, if it's not, list your own category. Uh, the why, uh, field would list possible goals for engaging that range from providing information to affecting policy. Why are we doing this? To learn from others to inform work. And again, we would have a list of different uh, possibilities, especially in engagement. Uh, and, but then it always, there would always be the other. And the who is really to identify who you would want to be engaging in this, uh, who the board needs to listen to, who can take action, and who could help or be opposed uh, to this goal. And then the way, again, gives examples of forms of engagement you could take, ranging from leveraging news and social media to seeking out private conversations. But really the four fields are intentionally not sequential, but the intent is just to get us thinking about all four of these, because we can all come up with crazy ideas, but if we can't figure out who we're gonna send it to, um, it's kind of uh, not gonna fare very well. For, and again, for each of these uh, four fields, we'll have a list from which you can draw to game out various scenarios, decide how you might want to, uh, to proceed uh, as we then would, EE would take it forward. And this list can continue to expand to new issues as we develop relationships with new partners. So if I can have the next slide. Uh, the next slide. Okay, so uh, <laughs> now it turns into a card game. To illustrate, here are a couple of examples. We have K through 12 STEM education, which would go uh, and s and &E indicators for what goes under the what. Uh, change culture um, and raise awareness could be under the why. Um, next slide, please. And then we could have a list of, of uh, here we have uh, industry leaders and news media as the who listening sessions and NSV personal connections as examples of the why. And so you see, we would have different examples uh, for each of these and you could use them or create your own uh, idea. So if we could just go back to the first slide. So the plan is, uh, if you all think this is, is worth pursuing, uh, there are multiple ways the board can use this tool. It can be a PDF uh, to go out for board orientation manual or a laminated hard copy. Uh, could be online. Uh, we can create a worksheet 
version that would let us you work through the four fields that are drop downs, whatever you would want. Uh, some fields could have been pre-populated pull down choices, while others could just allow you to uh, fill in, and maybe that's that's the what, uh, especially. So, but the point is that these worksheets would give us a quick us on the committee a quick read on what your thinking is, how you're thinking of uh, getting the message out, and uh, and you can just come up with crazy ideas and work through this. Uh, we're used to crazy ideas, and further down the road, we would look at creating this uh, online. And that's where I'm thinking uh, to allow you to put this in uh, pretty easily when you uh, really got a gr great idea and you just want to get it down before you forget it. So overall, our goal is for this tool to develop and consider and compare options to engage on a specific issue with a specific group in a specific way for a specific purpose. And from the set of options we generate to identify what's feasible and might be the biggest bang uh, for our efforts, because we can't do everything, but we also know that we don't have all the ideas for everything too. So this is a way for us to get more ideas and uh, especially on, on the different dimensions of the idea that you're putting in. And my hope is that the EE committee will have a committee meeting before Labor Day where we can use a worksheet format of the tool to map out specific uh, board engagement activities for fall and winter including engaging on the first three indicator reports and advancing the vision 2030 goals. So this might be a usable activity, for example, for the uh, board spa retreat. So uh, with that quick overview, let me see if there's any feedback or what you think about going this direction. Take any input whatsoever. We're the tail end of this board meeting. So any, any kind of input, any energy you've got left to give us input. Uh, well, I'll just say that I, I really like it. Um, you know, it'll, I think it'll help people focus, you know, and answer the important questions. And then hopefully that will help the committee prioritize because, you know, you can, you can always come up with these large lists, right? But then, then at some point you have to figure out, okay, what do, what do we real, who do we really need to target first? And in what way would it, would we be most effective? And hopefully this would be a tool that would allow the committee to to consider that. Thanks, Ellen. Anybody else? I'm not seeing anyone else. And okay. Maybe out of time as well. I'm not sure. All right. Well, uh, it's been fun working with Nadine and Reba on this. Um, and they just have such great ideas. I get energized for them by them. So thanks, everyone, uh, for listening to this and Ellen for your input. And that concludes my report. Thank you much. Uh, very much, Jerry, for the report out and for your ideas and uh, for participating in the meeting pilot uh, that we'll be talking about more. So I'm now going to turn to the open committee reports, and I'd like to start with the Committee on Strategies, Suresh Garamella. Yeah, the Committee on Strategies open meeting yesterday included an update on the current year budget and the FY22 budget. The committee also voted unanimously to create a subcommittee on technology, innovation, and partnerships. This subcommittee, chaired by Dario Gill uh, and with Heather Wilson and Dan Reed as members, is tasked with consulting with the director on strategies, goals, and organizational changes related to TIP and identifying governance matters for board discussion. Additional details will be included in the minutes. Madam Chair, that concludes my report. Thank you, Suresh. Uh, we'll go now to Committee on Oversight and Neela Sargent. You're muted. Anelia, you're muted. Sorry. One of the, maybe one day I'll remember. <laughs> it's, uh, so the committee had, a, um, had its meeting about five minutes ago, and most of you were there. And so, as you know, we received a very inf um, important and um, informative uh, presentation from the Office of Integrative Activities and highlighting the, some of the key points of the most recent uh, Merit Review Digest. And as a result, the committee voted to recommend 
that the board accept the 2020 digest subject to completion um, of the board overview, which is now underway. Um, we also had a fascinating update from the Office of Equity and Civil Rights, the Office of Information Resource Management, and we look forward to working with these offices in the coming months and years, probably, um, on activities um, of joint interest to us, of which there are many, um, because, of course, broader impacts is very broad. And then we heard our usual um, effective and efficient updates from the um, Inspector General and the Assistant Inspector General, and then and also the Chief Financial Officer. And Chief Financial Officer Teresa Grankovich um, also noted that she uh, very much appreciated that the Vice Chair, our Vice Chair, Steve Willard's um, was opening um, a new cooperative relationship um, with BFA in the matter of um, uh, risk management for the NSF. And we're glad that she likes it as much as we do. And so with that, I complete my report, Madam Chair. Thank you, Anila. Uh, next is the Committee on National Science and Engineering Policy, Julia Phillips. Uh, thank you, Ellen. And um, the, as you all know, uh, the SEP committee met yesterday. Um, we had an update on indicators 2022, which is continuing down the pike um, with some of the reports already released. Um, and uh, we discussed the release of the um, board companion policy uh, one pager entitled the US must improve K-12 STEM education for all which um, accompanies was released slightly after the recent publication of the indicators 2022 report on elementary and secondary STEM education. Uh, that one pager uh, calls for an all hands on deck approach to prioritize delivery of effective high quality STEM education for all K-12 students to sustain US competitiveness. We also discussed a number of themes for board policy messages to accompany the release of the in January 2022 of the Indicators 2022 Summary Report, the State of US Science and Engineering 2022. Uh, we have ha received good input from the committee and the board on high level messages to prioritize in this companion document. I'd emphasize particularly the connection between those messages and Vision 2030 and the opportunities that this provides to shine a light on our vision. Uh, that will help shape the SEP's work in the next several months. And uh, that concludes my report. Thank you, Julia. And uh, finally, the Committee on Awards and Facilities, Carl Weinberger. Thank you very much, Ellen. Um, I have to tell you, it's a warm feeling to be the caboose on a long train. And we are getting there. So on July 9th, 2021, Awards and Facilities held an open meeting for an update and discussion of NSF's Antarctic Infrastructure Modernization for Science, better known as AIMS project. The impact of COVID-19 pandemic on AIMS construction and scientific research conducted in Antarctica has led NSF to revisit and refresh the McMurdo uh, master plan and to develop a long-term plan for research infrastructure in Antarctica. Emerging infra infrastructure needs will be integrated into the newly created Antarctic Infrastructure Recapitalization, better known as AIR, program, which will be a portfolio of infrastructure investments. NSF will bring a pipe, a rebaselining of AIMS to the board early in fiscal year 2022. The ANF committee asked NSF to keep the board informed of their progress in developing AIR and to provide a timetable of when board decisions would be appropriate. Full details will be in the committee minutes. This concludes my report, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Carl. Okay, we have one last item on the agenda and that is two votes. Uh, the first is to accept the 2020 Merit Review Digest. 
And I'd like to echo Anila's comments from her uh, Committee on Oversight session and thanking Susie Iacono and her team for their dedication in putting together this report. Do I hear a motion to accept the 2020 Merit Review Digest? So moved. Second? Second. 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 Thank you. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. The motion passes and the 2020 Merit Review Digest is accepted. As was discussed in the committee session, the digest publication will be held until the board has completed and approved its overview for the report. For our last item of official business, we have the vote on the draft calendar year 2022 NSB meeting schedule. And so these dates are in your board book. You'll note we've asked you to save two dates for the late fall meeting. And that's in order to offer some voice to the new members who will be joining next year, hopefully in May. Is there a motion to approve the schedule? So moved. So moved. Is there a second? second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. The motion passes. As we come to the close of the meeting, I wanna thank everyone for your attendance, your participation, um, especially to our guest speakers. I also wanna acknowledge, of course, the work of the NSF staff, the NSBO team members, uh, executive officer, John Basie, all of the work uh, that goes into this meetings and express my appreciation for the steps you've taken these past you know, 16, 17 months to make our meetings work well in a fully virtual environment. We know that means many hours of behind the scenes work and we appreciate that. Is there any other business we need to address before we adjourn? Hearing none, I now adjourn this 473rd meeting of the National Science Board. Great. Great job, Ellen. Everybody. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you all. I really appreciate Great job. it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take care. Great meeting. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Bye. Bye. Bye.